Aragon, he's a goal scorer. What about Dante? Dante's his own breed. Give me two seconds, Eichel and Svetch, and I'll be coming at your neck. Richard Zednick, laugh past the breadstick, our Tammy will bury. Send him on his merry way, lest it's on carry. What's sadder than KK's broken spleen? Leafs fan with hopes and dreams. Rick Moose is back for season three with hot takes like you wouldn't believe. Okay. I'll block shots. I rescind that. You've never blocked a shot for me. Now let's turn it over to the host of the show. His character's high, but his skill level's low. Kid back checks like you don't even know. Championship flow, Jonathan Quick is a schmo. Yeah. Oh, hello there. Tis the season. Last year was like treason. Stanley Cup, more like a COVID cup. The year of Cooper was more a big blooper, like Ferris Bueller and a brand new cruiser. Oh, hell, hell. Now my car is a star, moves like a sports car. He can sauce like a boss and crisscross like Art Ross. He's peanut butter smooth like Quinn Hughes and a work of art like that upstart Carter Hart. Mmm, that's good coconut right there. So in comes Keith. Will the boys be Leaf? Can Jumbo Joe and Austin Smo avoid another repeat? It's time to start the show, so turn up the stereo. Put your feet up, relax, enjoy a Bud Light Jack. Greetings and salutations, and welcome to Season 3, Episode 2 of the Rink Moose hockey podcast an episodic podcast where two good friends get together to discuss all things nhl and their implications in the fantasy hockey universe i am one of your hosts as always nick cost you along with my good pal on this cold thursday night how are you doing on this fine evening I'm still trying to regroup after that horrible fucking tournament we just watched. But more importantly, we're joined by a new guest of the show. His first time on the pod. It's a great, uh, great to have him. His name's Josh Schechter. He's the Genghis Khan of sports, a brutal emperor in every sense of the word. Uh, this guy uh, pretty much follows everything, and uh, he's got a really keen uh, sense for fantasy sports in general. And uh, as we just saw with the latest trade p- proposal, uh, this guy's not afraid to think outside the box. So, uh, Josh Schechter, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, fellas. Uh, appreciate the, the the subtlety of my intro. Genghis Kong really, <laughs> really describes me well. I think I father almost as many kids as he has. <laughs> I, uh, I should hope so. I should hope so. I, I was actually going to introduce you as... Uh, Freezer tarp. <laughs> what? That's what you're going off uh, as on our, in our fantasy league. So please explain that. Freezer yeah, tarp. The senators and Commodores. Listening. Freezer tarp. Oh. Freezer tarp is a uh, it's, it's it's a lifestyle choice. You know when you're when you're knocking a few back for the boys and get a little hot, you just toss your tarp in the freezer, cool off for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> is that right? Eh? I think you guys should get on the train. I mean, freezer tarps is the next big wave. Wow. Wow. Okay. Already learning shit, and we haven't even talked about hockey. Well, I'll tell you what. It's a lot better than your goddamn name last year. That was probably the one of the worst in the league, if, if not the worst. I'll take that. It was pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> and your, un, your unwillingness to change it was even worse. Like, I, I would have thought of man, a man of your color would, uh, would be able to think of something better. You know what? I was too deep in the numbers to even consider it. I, uh, I, I was, I was pulling my results, and I was like, you know what? If the num- if the name's working for me right now, why change it? Mm-hmm. And, you know, had the season continued past when it uh, unfortunately came to an end, who knows? Maybe I would have come away with the dub, and the name would have stuck. But here we are today. Ten point eight three nine is now gone, and now we got. Freezer tarps. The new now, just really, uh, really quickly, I don't remember exactly where you finished in last year's fantasy league. Were you third or were you second in that? I believe the final standings had me third, but um, how we finished that week, I would have pulled out a second. So, but, but who's counting, right? I mean, we're on to a new season. 
a new strat, a perfected mm-hmm. strat. Yeah, so Josh did really well last year. And by using such an unconventional method too, like if you saw his team on paper, you, you'd kind of laugh it off a little bit. But then when you really dig into the numbers, the peripherals were fantastic. The goaltending was fantastic. And uh, if I'm a betting man, I might even suggest that Josh would look to uh, use a similar strategy this year, given his, uh, his keepers are both goalies. So uh, it'll be interesting, and we'll definitely get into the fantasy talk uh, super soon. Yeah, no, and, and I got beef to pick with Josh too because I, I think one of his keepers is uh, in for a tough season. There's the beer. I agree. Uh, but we'll, we'll get into that later. Um, moving on, we got to address this. It's the story of the week. It's been the story of the month. But it came to a halting end just, I guess, a couple nights ago. Yes. And that's the World Junior uh, Championships, which concluded uh, Tuesday night in Red Deer, or or where were they? Edmonton. Edmonton. It, yeah, they'll be in Red Deer next year. And uh, hey, <clears throat> basically all the pundits were wrong, and uh, the United States upset Canada in the final. Uh, I know I have a few thoughts. I know Kyle's going to have a lot of thoughts based <clears throat> on his uh, reaction. We were watching the game together on Tuesday. Uh, I mean, where do we start? We we have we have the game itself, which was, I mean, kind of boring to be honest. Probably not that. And I don't know. Like it, it had drama, but it definitely wasn't an overtime thriller. There was no Eberly moment. Oh God. There's there's kooky stuff I want to get into. You know, like the it was a weird start time, like a nine thirty start time. The U.S. brought a barrel onto the ice at the end oh of the God. game. The tears that were shed in the metal. Oh, God. I mean, there's just so oh. much. So uh, where do you want to start with this? Well, you know, I want to I back out a little bit from the final game. I just want to say, from a Canadian fan's perspective, this was, to me, the most disappointing World Juniors tournament, even outside of the finals. Like, I was just – there was very little interesting – on the edge of your seat kind of games for Canada. Like, it just seems like they crushed their big opponents and they, you know, kind of played like shit against their weaker opponents. And then they flubbed the final. Like, it was just all in all, I was waiting for this big climax of the final game. And, uh, and then we laid this egg. And then it was just, that's what killed me the most is I didn't enjoy the journey there. You know, I didn't, I didn't get this, you know, new player that I've fallen in love with. I didn't get that at all throughout this whole tournament. And I'm sure a lot of factors go into that, but it was just disappointing on so many levels. And, and, and even aside from that, the whole Twitter war that we got into as, as, <laughs> as a, as a team here, that was just adding to the fact that, you know what, I'm ready to move on from this, but, uh, but yeah, I got some things to say about that barrel big time. All right. Well, let me just summarize what happened going into that game. So but to me, it looked like one team, the U.S., had a terrible start to the tournament, lost a game 5-3 to mm-hmm. Russia, but that, that looks generous. They were really down 4-1 in the third period in that game. Spencer Knight was pulled on four goals on 12 shots. It was a miserable Christmas night for Alex Turcott and the U.S. team. And they went on to string... A bunch of wins. I believe the goalie Knight had three straight shutouts. Um, they capped it off by beating Sweden for nothing in dominant fashion on New Year's Eve. They came from behind, or sorry, I guess Finland came from behind, and and and, and they went on to dispatch of Finland via Arthur Kalli of game-winning goal in the semifinal. And to me, it looked like they just, they started off rough, but game by game, they started getting better. And Canada was spoiled from the start. The easiest group they've been in, in arguably their history as a team. Sure. Dispatching Switzerland and uh, Slovakia, Germany, uh, a shorthanded Germany team, 16 goals. Sure. Is that something? Yeah. 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 Even Finland, the game we thought would be a game. It wasn't a game. They no. dominated. 
And that's what started the debate. Is this the greatest team Canada ever assembled? Does this match Sid the Kid in 2005? Mm. And quarterfinals come. They dispatch of the checks. Closer than you, th- you, know, you thought the game would be. But territorially and statistically, analytically, they still dominated. You go into the semifinal. I thought it would be an instant classic. We were sitting here with the boys. We ordered wings. It was going to be a big night. Mm. And no, it's a blowout. Uh, what was it? Five nothing? Which I predicted. Which you predicted. And come the final, they still were not really tested. They had yet to face any adversity. <clears throat> and sure enough, first six, seven minutes of the game, Turcotte scores. And that was the adversity. They had never trailed. They never gave up a, uh, a even strength goal. They finally get scored on, and it just looked like they were lost. And every single shot of Trigny on the bench just looked like a confused bus driver. <laughs> like looking at his, you know, players and just raising his eyebrows and not knowing what to do. <laughs> and that's that was that to me was the look that made me think this might be a not their night. And, of course, Zegras scores the fluky goal at the start of the second. That doesn't help. Literally, the guy who was chirping the team going into the game saying Levi hadn't been tested. Fuck that guy. I mean, and I love those quotes, by the way. I, I know think it was do. fantastic. We need more of that in the league. Too many safe interviews in the NHL nowadays. I think this, this kid is a fresh breath of air, you know? Yeah, whatever. And, yeah, after that, it was shutdown mode. And Canada couldn't really get anything going. I mean, Bowen Byram played the game of his life, hit one off the post. That's as close as they got. And everything else, Cousins looked uncharacteristically bad. I didn't think Drysdale did really great. Man. Um, you know, some guys who I thought had pushed, like Tomasino, weren't getting enough ice time, in my opinion. It was just a weird night. And it ended... Uh, Oh, I in terrible fashion. I, I have to bring this up just because I know Josh is a little bit of a fan, but that if that breakaway from McMichael goes in, or at least, yeah, I'll say if that goes in, because you know he was in a clutch moment. He's he's supposed to be a clutch player. He's a returning guy. That was to me the game breaking moment, <clears throat> and I don't know what happened. It just looked like McMichael lost where he was and kind of ran it into the goalie. Uh, what are your thoughts on that one, Josh? I know you like the kid. Yeah, I knew this was coming. Uh, you, you give Kyle one one inch and he takes a mile. <laughs> I mean, to say anything less than Michael was a breakout candidate, I think is uh, selling him short. If anything, yeah, I think he's put his name in the forefront of players to watch coming out of this tournament. Uh, he was arguably Canada's most uh, consistent forward throughout the tournament. Then, you know, despite him being able to or not being able to finish on the breakaway, I still think he was able to generate a lot of chances, drive his line, uh, you know, keep his responsibilities defensively tight, play on the PK and the power play. Um, yeah, I mean, to say it was a TSN turning point, hashtag not sponsored, um, I'll give you that, but. You know, nine times out of ten, he's going to make that. Uh, he's going to take advantage of that, capitalize on it. And I'm looking forward to seeing what he does with uh, the Capitals. Yeah, I mean, I I, th- I know I made this comment to Nick. I don't know if I made it to you as well. But to me, a lot of these OHL guys in particular, guys who haven't played in so long, and I know WHL guys haven't played either, but uh, a lot of OHL guys stuck out to me. Like McMichael, was, he was good in the tournament. I thought he would be like one of Team Canada's marquee, marquee players. Uh, Perfetti was disappointing to me. Byfield was a bit disappointing to me. Jack Quinn was disappointing to me. It just seems like these OHL guys kind of didn't perform the way I'd, I would have liked them to. So I think a lot of that is the fact that they haven't been on the ice. And I don't know what the other guys have been doing. Some guys have, you know, been playing in college or the Q or whatever. But I just seem like the OHL guys got stung by that a bit more than other players. Well, not to mention, like, 
Team Canada cumulatively, only five guys had played any games before <clears throat> camp, mm. right? One of them was Jordan Spence, and I think he only played like one game. Whereas the U.S., they've had their college season, albeit not a full season, but they still had games, you know? Yeah, yeah. So um, they were a little more seasoned. I, I got I to gotta ask you guys this because it's been something, obviously, that's rolling around online. Do you think it's fair to bring up the argument of who could have come to the tournament? Like, is that just low-hanging fruit that's just kind of not taking the loss like a man? Like, those guys who bring up, oh, but Doc, oh, but Lafreniere, uh, are those guys justified? Or, or are the U.S. just going to say, oh, but Hughes, oh, but, you know, uh, Nick Robertson? Like, I think there's an argument there. If this was a best on best, I think we would have easily handled this team. You know, last year's MVP – not to mention Doc was an NHLer. Like, I think those would have tipped the scales, even if Jack Hughes came, even if Nick Robertson came, you know. But maybe I'm just being a bitch about that. I don't know. I think it's a fair point to bring up. Um, you know, obviously there were two noticeable omissions from Canada's roster, one due to injury and one due to, um, you know, his availability in the NHL. But – to your point, I think you can do that with any team in the tournament. Uh, Sweden lost their head coach early on. Um, Germany had to, to quarantine twice, not, th- not that they were going to compete or anything. But um, I, I think it's, uh, it's one of those what-if scenarios that will never be answered. The history books are going to show Canada with a silver, USA with, a bron- or with the, the gold, and that's just how we're going to have to move on with our lives. Um, what do you think, Nick? Yeah, I mean, it's an anomaly year. It's it's those weird COVID, you know, effects. I mean, Germany was running three forward lines. Like, that's like beer league stuff. And yet it's happening at this semi-professional level, which is crazy. But I don't think it's an excuse. I mean, even without those guys, you evaluate the tournament for the rosters that are on paper – when the tournament starts, it's, it's, be, it's best on best. You know, some guys aren't there because of their NHL camps, but so be it. It, it. You're still evaluating the teams on paper from day one. And the reality is Canada was the favorites and they didn't meet the expectation. Mm-hmm. And had they won, they would have solidified their legacy as arguably the best team assembled ever. And I think by flopping that gold medal game, they're going to sit well behind that 05 team. In fact, Kyle, this might get you pissed, but I'd go so far as to say in the past, you know, 10 years, the USA have dominated the tournament. No, I disagree. Four, four gold medals in the past 10 years, and that's more than any other country. And perhaps <clears throat> this USNDP model where you have these players playing and practicing and eating meals together seemingly every day is a really strong model. And perhaps Canada's going to have to start their own USNDP model. I know it's far-fetched, but I'm, I'm looking at the results and they speak for themselves. Four tournament wins since 2010. Um, well, you know what, if you're... Yeah, go on. Yeah, go on, Josh. Because I, I have a I have a thought on the U.S. national development team model, and I think it's a, an unpopular opinion, but I, I see this as a very short-sighted development program. They um, having those players play together throughout their whole upbringing doesn't help <clears throat> them when they get to the NHL. I think it, it only helps them to compete at the World Juniors. Having that chemistry is absolutely an advantage, but once they get away from playing with people their own age, they're, they're untested, they're unproven. And I think that it's a very short-sighted way of getting a group of guys to compete at a tournament that they weren't very competitive in 20 years ago. Yeah, and, and I think to add on to that, I think the U.S. is almost forced to do that because let's be honest, the CHL, is a really great development league and, and the USHL that is kind of the American equivalent to that is just nowhere close. So if you were to force all your American kids to 
either go to the USHL or the CHL, then they'd be kind of like, well, we need this national development team program to help our kids. But here in Canada, I mean, we've the best players on, you know, that have ever played have come out of the CHL, you know, and, and there's some big markets that do a really great job of, of bringing guys up like a London, like an Ottawa, like a Halifax. And I think um, like, it's, it's good to have that variety. And, uh, and I like the system the way it is. Like, like to, anyone who comes to me and says, Oh, Canada's starting to lag behind. I, I shake my head to those people. I, I don't know what to say to you. Like, look at the top players in the game. Uh, g- give me anyone other than McDavid and, and McKinnon, and I'll, I'll, see you, I'll see you out the door. Like, it's just – and then McCarr is the top, you know, young defenseman. Like, you're just out of control with these, with these outlandish ideas that Canada's slipping in any way. Well, I, I can't, I can't <clears throat> disagree with that. Like, they are – still the model country if you go rank the top five players top 10 players in the nhl they're still mostly canadian the best player is canadian the second best player is canadian the third best player is canadian but they're like josh said there's something to be said about just developing young kids amateurs for this tournament and the u.s has got something going and I think it shows with the four golds <clears throat> since 2010. And it, 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 the model works. If, if you're just judging it based on World Junior success and grooming these young kids to get drafted, not necessarily to actually produce at the NHL level, it works. Fine. Yeah, that, yeah I guess it does. But, I mean... That being said, this was said to be and probably is that model's prime year. Like, this is the best NTDP year, birth year ever. And uh, if this is the peak, I'm kind of disappointed. You know? Well, they did They did beat a <clears throat> historically good Canada team. So I don't know how you can be disappointed by that. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, 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 the birth child of this program is probably a Jack Hughes like the poster, the most recent poster boy, and look how he did in the NHL last year. No but one, again, but no one goes from we're this not program. We're talking about NHL here. Wow, well, we're just. I thought we were talking within, about the strength of the program within the confines of this tournament and developing amateurs. Fine, fine. that's it. Fine, I I will I will give you that. Okay, uh, so let's talk about the barrel. <clears throat> I'd so, love to talk about the barrel. Yeah. So afterwards. They bring out this barrel. More, it was actually a garbage. It was like a garbage can <laughs> with Canada plastered on it, the logo. And they took a photo beside it with no context. So people like us are looking and going, well, what the fuck? It's a garbage can with Canada plastered on it. What are they trying to do here? And it takes until the head coach afterwards to tell this story about the Sahara Desert and some guy crossing and every four miles you could see the next one and how that was a story that motivated the kids and got them through the tournament. Put to me, it, it. hey, the story afterward, like hearing it, okay, great. But the point is when you do that, when you put the garbage can on the ice and flex without giving any context to the <clears throat> you know, public, the general public, the horse has already left the barn. Like we are going to see that and we're going to go, well, what the fuck? They're flexing and making fun of us. And even it doesn't matter what the coach says afterwards, how he dresses it up. It, the horse has left the barn and that's it. Um, so to me, it just wasn't a good look. No, it's not a good look. And I, I think the coach can say whatever he wants. The Zegers can say whatever he wants whatever he wants, but let's be honest, it, it is a sign of disrespect. Why does it have to be a barrel? You know, like that's just like, at least bring out a barrel. If you're going to, it's going to be a barrel, bring out a barrel. That was a garbage can. It, it, it was as close to a garbage can as you can get. Let's just put it that way. It, it was disrespectful. I don't care what anybody says, what story they're using. Uh, you can, you can fucking take pictures of it in the dressing room. You know, like, like you said, to bring it out on the ice with the Canada thing on it, like, you're just – it's just a poor show of, of sportsmanship, in my opinion. And it pisses me off. And that's what gets me going on about, you know, 
I wish these other guys were here, man. Like I wish fucking, I don't know. I don't want to get into it. I'm too upset about this, but I'm telling you like doc would have fucking dusted that stupid little Zegris kid. I hate this fucking kid. I it hate does, him. It does seem very par for the course with how the Americans have positioned themselves, um, how they want to be seen as uh, these, uh, you know, confident, some may say cocky individuals who, um, you know, I've never faced much adversity growing up in that program, right? They're playing on the best team in that league. And, and uh, you know, one time that can't, that their potential to face any adversity, they, you know, they win. And so that just adds to the hubris and, you know, almost emboldens them to bring something like that onto the ice which in a normal year, you would never, you never see uh, a trash can being brought onto the ice. You would never see that. And had there be fans in the stands when they did that, I can't imagine how much how loud the booze would have been if people yeah. caught wind of a garbage can with can of Canadian flag on it being uh, posed with as you know the American skate around victory. And it's it's just something I could never imagine us, Sweden, Finland doing. Like maybe a Russia, sure. But like that's just that's crazy, man. That's at least it just makes Russian me even more upset. Blame it being lost in translation or something, but sure. Yeah, but this is just there's no excuse for this. And I, I hate those people who are like Canadians who are trying to defend this, saying, Oh yeah, like don't be so immature. It's just a cool thing they do. No, I'm not buying that. Not for a second. Um, the charter flight back home. Right. It's reported that Anaheim and LA collaborated and flew the Southern California boys to camp. Yeah. If you're a fly on the wall in that <laughs> charter, what do you think's going on? Is it just Drysdale and Byfield sitting in the corner lonely while <laughs> Turcotte and Zegris and Kaliev are doing shots? Was Byfield no, yeah. on the plane? I, I didn't see him at all during that game, so <laughs> I'm not sure if he made it. Oh, we got to talk either. about him, eh? Oh, number two overall to. pick. Where was? Hey, yeah, hey, and, and if you've been following Josh, like I said before the draft, LA's taken Stutzel. Mm. I was convinced, and that was that was the course they had to take as as a as a true LA Kings fan. Mm-hmm. And you must be disappointed. Oh, it must be an understatement it's been to say a disappointed. Tough week, man. It's been a tough oh, two weeks God. trying to sleep. Because every at least if Stutzel wasn't so good, then I'd be like, all right, fine. But the fact he was arguably the player of the tournament, unarguably the most valuable, you know, valuable to his team. Uh it, it's not a good look. No. And it's also not gonna look good when he opens camp with the Sens and probably plays <clears throat> past the six game tryout. I think that's oh, yeah. indefinite. Oh yeah. Um so yeah, I mean Byfield, yeah, he had some physicality, but that was all you'd cheer for. He had the good game against Switzerland, but who gives a fuck if you're getting garbage time goals yeah. against arguably the worst team in the tournament. He did not step up in the important games. The only big moments was when he would lay a guy out. And I and being the ultimate optimist, I'd probably say the only positive was he just showed more, I don't know, I guess intensity on the forecheck than I had seen. Good forecheck. You know, back checking. Like he just had an effort. Yeah. But other than that, like other than that second win that I had never seen before, he didn't dominate. He didn't make plays. He didn't make any other guys look good. It, 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 he, to me, he was one of the disappointments of the tournament. I have a theory behind behind this, and I think it – um it has to do with him, but I think it also has to do with um, what happened to Kirby Doc and the LA Kings getting nervous about seeing their number two overall pick getting injured. And I think they had a conversation with uh, Hockey Canada and said, we don't want him playing in a prominent role. Because his talent and the fact that he was a returning player should have put him in a prime position to get top six minutes. The fact that he was playing down in the lineup speaks to either the coach's lack of trust or that someone else stepped in and said something because by all accounts, he should have been a contributor for Canada and 
he certainly wasn't, and he did not look very engaged at all um, in any of the games, really. I don't know. I, I don't know, Josh. That, there, that's, but... that's far – I don't. That's that's a hot take, man. That's a hot, hot, scorching take. Uh, maybe I have fallen too deep into a rabbit hole. Who knows? The the thing about this player, he's such a polarizing figure for all the 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 professionals out there. Like the last year, everyone was defending him, saying youngest player on the team. Wait till next. Wait till next year. Now this year's come along. He's still the youngest player on the team. And and what are the excuses now? I mean, it's just. Well, we've been pretty vocal on this show about how he hasn't shown up in big games, big tournaments. He's been very lackluster internationally for his career, for that matter. He's, I don't know, he just, this just seems like it's, it was predictable at, at, to some degree. Uh, I'm not sure LA had a hand in this, but Nick and I, we, we kind of watched as, as the tournament went on, we just kind of shook our heads every time he fumbled or bumbled a puck you know because we knew this was coming I mean it's it's it, it, I don't know if he deserved to go for second overall and and many people will tell you you're a fucking moronic racist prick for saying that but I mean this guy's a very polarizing figure and the fact of the matter is he hasn't had a history of showing up in big games or big tournaments well not not to mention like I get your <clears throat> argument about him not wanting to get injured Josh but I think the LA Kings know that he's not playing for them this year. Like they don't need him. No, they, he's not. This is, he's this not. is purely <laughs> developmental, sending him to the world juniors, get him his reps and hopefully he dominates, adds it to his resume. And he looks all the better in a year or two years when he's playing full time <clears throat> for the Kings, but he's not playing past those six tryout games. Like I, I bet my life on that. It's not happening. But why, why wouldn't LA want to invest in, the youth right now, just see what they have. Do oh, what no, Ottawa has done. And for, let first their young off, guys he's play. not he's not like Stutzel. Like he's not developmentally, he's not there right now. Stutzel's dominated two world juniors. Byfield's yet to dominate one. <clears throat> um they don't need him. They have they have enough prospects right now and they're not trying to compete right now. They they already exactly know the expectations are low. I, I don't know. I, they'll, they'll let him play in Ontario for the Ontario Reign. He'll get his reps in the AHL. There's now a rule where OHL players can play in the AHL. Um, and I think they're just going to do that. And they'll watch him. He'll, he'll be practicing in El Segundo in their practice facility. That's where the Kings uh, practice. And they'll have their eyes on him. But he doesn't need to prove anything in the NHL right now. In fact, you might just hurt his confidence. Because if he couldn't dominate the World Juniors... There's no fucking way in hell he's dominating in the NHL. And unless he's going to dominate or have some mm. tangible effect game to game, there's no point of having him on your team. Is he even That's allowed the... to go to the AHL this year? Well, I just said, like, there's a rule. Because the OHL um, has been suspended yeah. this year, they've made this one-off <clears throat> rule where these OHL-eligible players can now play in the AHL as well until the OHL gets their act together. I don't know how I feel about that. That's taking away someone's job. Yeah. Oh, like the older guys, the semi-professional 30-whatever-year-olds playing the NHL. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> well, I mean, or the it's a shame, but it is what been... it is because organizationally, you, you definitely prioritize these young kids getting proper game time, right? I agree, yeah. It's just a shame. But uh, no, do you want to you want to move on from juniors? Do you have any final thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, unless Josh wants to add anything, I I would just conclude by saying, obviously Trevor Zegers MVP of the tournament, <clears throat> best forward of the tournament. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Vili Hinoa <clears throat> beat out Bowen Byram for best defenseman of the tournament. Uh, okay. And Devon Levi, despite the gold medal game won the best goalie Agreed. for basically having the best save percentage of any Canadian goalie ever. I believe it was something like 965. Mm. So there are your MVPs, so to speak. Finally, we can stop talking about Justin Pogge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what, uh, one quick thing on Levi. He, even in the final game, he really didn't make one mistake all tournament. 
Like there was no blunderous goals for the entire thing. He was just rock solid. Didn't get let in, let in a goal five on five. And, and those goals that did go in were just kind of not his fault. You know, the one Zegers one that went off of the fucking, uh, the stanchion and, and went right to him. Boy, that one hurt, but, uh, no, he he didn't make any errors, and this guy was like the storyline was the seventh rounder of the of the Panthers versus the first rounder of the Panthers. Uh, so yeah, very interesting, uh, very good guy to follow probably in his NHL career. I like the kid. What stuck out to me about Levi um, just before we we change topics here is uh, how consistent he was with his uh, rituals. You know, even in the sixteen to demolishing defeat of Germany uh, he every time there was a whistle stick over the right pad sip of water never let his head get um, you know he never let himself get out of his own head and he he stuck with his his uh, his routine every single time and I think that is a sign of a true uh, quality goaltender who you know never lets the moment get too big for him and mm-hmm. to your point uh, he deserved to win uh, the best goaltender at the tournament. Yeah, and such a likable kid, too. It just seems like he just really loves the game. Um, so moving on from that, we definitely want to try to dive into fantasy here. And and since you are a, a new member on the show, and we've never had you on for a fantasy uh, episode to the very least, uh, I, I always like to ask people this question, and I'll ask Nick again from a fresh perspective. Uh, so I pose the question to both of you. Fantasy hockey or fantasy sports in general, you always come to some sort of battle in your own head between what your gut says and what the stats say. I want to know how you balance these two factors in the way you choose your team and the way you manage your team. Are you simply a numbers guy? Do you look at the spreadsheets? Or do you mix in a little bit of gut or a lot of gut? And I, because uh, for me, one of my, my main problems perhaps is I, I mix in a lot of gut. So I want to hear your, your, both of your perspectives on that. Well, I'll hop in first. As, uh, you've touted me as a fantasy guru, so I'll try and live up to the hype. But uh, I think numbers can only take you so far. Right. If you, if the numbers are getting in one direction, but you're reading the room and it's telling you another direction, you have to listen to your gut at that point, um, because you know half of the battle is knowing who you're drafting against, who you're competing against. If you know that Nick's a LA Kings fan and he has a propensity to take an LA King player that you might want, or um, if someone has the name Austin Stash me or whatever it was. <laughs> is looking at Austin Matthews or someone else, you know, he's going to go. So you have to take into account who you're drafting with as much as you are the numbers, because that's how you find value. Yeah. I mean, long story short, I would just say I use an objective number based strategy or roster as my base. But then when it comes to deciding those, you know, marginal decisions like, oh, I could go with this guy or that guy. They're fairly close in my rankings. You know, position eligibility, they both kind of fit the bill. But I'm going to go with my gut in this case. Go with the guy that I favor, the guy I like watching more, the guy I'd rather own his jersey as as the guy. Mm -hmm. So I would still contest. I can't just go for my gut. I can't just make a list of gut guys. Because that doesn't cover every statistic that should be considered. This is a number-based sport. It's fantasy sports. So you shouldn't just let your gut overwhelm objectivity. Mm. And so there is a place for gut and use it. But you also can't forget, you know, your base, which is critical. I'll give you an example of one of my fatal flaws. I will never own an Alexander Ovechkin. As a Crosby guy my whole life, I could not cheer for the player. So I just can't own him because I wouldn't be happy with my team. You know, yeah. that's my problem. Well, I'll gladly I... take him. 
You're and not I, getting them. I hate drafting Leaf players. Kyle knows this. Oh. I hate drafting Leaf players because <clears throat> those teams that I watch every night, me being a Leaf fan, I hate having to watch a Leaf game with this ulterior motive in the back of my pocket, like, oh, I need Zach Hyman to get four hits tonight. Like, that bothers me. Or I need Freddie Anderson to let two or less. Like, that really bothers me. So I like to just sit down, if it's a team like the Leafs, and enjoy the game for what it is. I want to win. That's it. I don't care how many goals Matthew scores, how many power play points Marner gets. Doesn't matter to me. So those are really, that's really the only rule I have. To, to counter that point, what if you're playing against someone who has a Freddie go. goal and let's say he's having a great week and you need him to have a, put right. up a stinker so that you win? How do you, <laughs> you're how do you disassociate yourself? I've been there. I've been there. And my, my friends, my Leaf fans, <clears throat> they have ostracized me and said I'm a fake fan. When I, <laughs> when I low-key do like a fist pump in the back of the room, because Freddie just let his fourth goal in. And I don't know. In those occasions, the fantasy part of me overwhelms the fan in me, which is, a pro- which is problematic. And so that's why if I have any agency in that decision by drafting those Leaf players or not drafting those Leaf players, I opt not to draft them. But to your point, Josh, inevitably those conflicts of interest come up. Of course. And... Um- I just want to hunker back to one point about how you, one way that I have um, remained or have introduced my gut feel into an objective matter, which is drafting a, a fantasy roster. And I find that creating tiers of players is um, kind of a sweet spot where you identify players who are in the same range and then you can use your gut to, t- to say, okay, this player is the one I like the most out of these four players in the same tier. And that's something that I use uh, to satisfy um, my, my gut while also remaining objective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good one. I, I don't go into tiers too much. I've done that in baseball before, not so much hockey. But uh, like, I'll be honest, I'll make my rankings. I'll have them go top to bottom. And if it's a gut guy, I'll simply highlight that name and I'll keep out for those guys. And hopefully I can get two birds with one stone. I can get a guy who maximizes statistical value. Like he should go in that round and he's a gut guy. Um, And that's my hope. It doesn't always end up that way. Sometimes I end up taking a statistical guy ahead of my gut reaction because objectively he's going to have a better year, but, and they'll hear like those, so those decisions do hurt. But most of the time, I try to strike two birds with one stone. Mm. Uh, I want to get into some general thoughts before we dive into our obvious our positional stuff here. Um, just some things to point out because we are working with a shortened season here. Uh, shortened season means injuries matter a lot more than before. And uh, major players missing time could spell disaster. So what I would recommend is if you know there's a guy, say a Geno Malkin, who you know is an injury-prone guy, you might want to think twice about where he's going in his ADP. Coupled with the fact that since it is a shortened schedule, it's more condensed. They're playing more often than they usually would. It's going to aggravate that fact even more. So if I'm going into playoffs and and Malkin gets injured for me, I might be absolutely sunk. So keep in mind injury uh, history when uh, when drafting uh, in this season in particular. Um, My general advice this year, given the unorthodox season, would be consider the schedule because now it's a – weird schedule where each team in every division is going to play each other team eight to 10 times. And as a fan, I still don't know what to think of this, like whether I'm going to get bored of it, you know, by, by March evening, I'll be like, well, fuck it's the Sens again, Sens and Leafs. Here we go. Round seven. Or am I going to be like, Oh wow. What a rivalry it's been so far. And I get to see even more of it, but that's beyond the point. 
the, the main point I want to make is that in the past, I've always put a lot of stock into schedule. When I draft players, I will look at their team schedule for those key playoff weeks. You know, what's Boston's schedule? If I want to load up on uh, mm. Tuka Rask and Yarrow Halak timeshare, you know, what are those last two weeks of the seasons like? Are they playing Arizona and LA and New Jersey? Or are they playing St. Louis, Vegas, and Colorado? You know, that's critical. Because if I already know I'm going to make the playoffs, which not to brag, is almost a, you know, it's an inevitable conclusion. Every <laughs> you don't time know I'm in that. A fantasy Come on. <laughs> um, all that matters to me is the playoffs. And I've made trades before where I've clearly traded a better player on paper for a worse player. But that worse player has got a better playoff schedule. Now, of course, the weird thing this year is you can't really do that because it's not the same like every other year where every team's going to play every other team. It's just a matter of when they play them. Instead, this year, you're only confined to those other seven teams in your division. So really, you can't really do that. But you could look at what teams your players are going to play off again. So you may want to own a lot of forwards in the North division, knowing that that's going to be a very point heavy league where Winnipeg's going to light team, like light teams up and the Leafs will do the same and the Oilers will do the same in Ottawa. Don't, don't sleep on them. So things like that, you got to consider. And then like out West, there's not going to be a lot of goal scored. Arizona, L.A., San Jose. Except when it's Colorado. Yeah, Colorado, they're going to laugh playing L.A. eight times. Oh, yeah. It's going to be a joke, <laughs> those games. <laughs> like, and you're, you're going to be the beneficiary if you have hmm. Grubauer or... Um, Francis. Francis. Franchise. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that would be my two cents. The schedule, it's a one-off year. It's a weird year. But please take that advice. Consider the division that your players are in, whether they be forwards or goalies. If you have goalies, you probably want them in the west or the east. And if you have forwards or defense, you probably want them in the north division or the central. So that's what I'd say. One more thing on schedules. So, no, go ahead. Go on, go, go on, Josh. I was just going to say, I was going to take this one step further and say, if you're looking at a draft strategy, draft players in the west division you're playing against your players are going up against the, either the ducks the wild the kings and the sharks and the coyotes 40 games all those teams are going to be trash this year mm-hmm. and if you want a player on uh, if you have a player on the blues the abs or the golden knights they're going to be putting up points in droves yeah yeah i like that and and right when- well, my other point would be, let's say you own, I don't know, Matt Murray. What a terrible pick. What a terrible pick. <laughs> you you got you to gotta play Winnipeg 10 times, Toronto 10 times, <clears throat> Vancouver 10 Montreal. times. Montreal. Edmonton 10 times. Montreal 10 times. <laughs> but, but even that one, like Matt Murray is going to go lower in drafts. Let's think of someone else, like Connor Hellebuck, whose ADP is 18. Oh, we'll I love the guy. He's a Vezina Trophy winner. But he can still get lit up by the Leafs. He can still get lit up by Edmonton mm-hmm. or Montreal. So I don't think his stock is warranted at 18, to be honest. So, yeah. One more observation on the schedule here. But now this is more of an assumption from my part. But considering the condensed schedule, there's going to be more back-to-back scenarios, meaning that um, starting goalies will be a, of lesser value and backup goalies will be of higher value than regular years. Um, if your team does go for, you know, is a team that doesn't play a, a starting goalie back-to-back nights. It just means that starting goalies will be of, compared to other years, a little bit lesser of value. Kyle, that's a great point. And I'm going to use a term from fantasy football called the handcuff, where if you have – a number one goalie that you're happy with, you should be looking for his backup in the later rounds to secure that position. Especially mm. if you think that 
the team that he plays for is going to be a playoff team a la the Tampa Bay Lightning, a la the Golden Knights, a la the Avalanche, as we've mentioned. These these teams are, you know, uh, projected to be playoff teams. And if you believe that, you should be getting not only their starting goalie, but also securing the handcuff with the backup goalie. Agreed. Except there's some teams that are a little weird. Like Tampa Bay. Like Vasilev, like there, there's a huge margin between the starter and the backup. So some nights Vassy might get both games. You know? It, it, the, the farther away it is from a timeshare situation, the more likely the goalie is going to play back-to-back. So, like, I don't see a Tuka Rask playing back-to-back because Halak is, you know, marginally behind him. But Vasilevsky and his backup, I guess it's McElhenney. I could see Vasilevsky starting a lot. Or Bennington and Vili Huso. Vili Huso has never played in the NHL. Mm. I don't think Vili Huso is ready for 24 <clears throat> games. Mm. So, yes, I would agree with on... the point you guys made. But I wouldn't say it applies in all cases. Mm. I'm, I'm curious your opinion on the Canadians goalie situation then. How do you feel about Jake Allen? Is he? I, a... Oh, I, I think Jake Allen's going to get his reps. I, I don't like Jake Allen. Long-time <laughs> listeners know that. I, I, I think he's done something to revitalize his career. You know, he's, he, he's added a few things to his game that have made him more, you know, a little better objectively. But I think a lot of his success the last few years just arrived behind being a very structured St. Louis team. I don't think he's going to have that in Montreal where they played a little more loose, especially under this new Julien system, the fun way he calls it. (laughs) And I, I don't think Jake Allen will have nearly as good a statistical year. But to start the season for the first half, I think they're going to give him every shot to prove himself, given the salary he's making and just keeping Carey Price fresh for the playoffs. So I think if you draft Jake, you're still going to get your reps. You're still going to get, like, you're still going to get the starts. But I don't think statistically, split wise, you're going to get much back. Did I hear you say playoffs in Montreal in the same sentence? (laughs) <laughs> That's a wow it sounds like we got joseph camilleri on the show and everyone <laughs> every guest we have hates montreal how do well, you feel about this kyle like this is this is brutal kyle knows that i'm a carry price truther yeah i think montreal is gonna win the whole division <laughs> okay i really do i really do plus i mean, back to your point about the goalies that if from a price perspective i think this improves prices splits across the board and uh, it also lowers his win count because he's not going to be playing as much. Now, that being said, Price had the, was tied for the most amount of games played with Connor Halibut last year. So he's still going to get a good amount of games, just not as much. If I'm not mistaken, they haven't changed the rule where the most goals wins in a game, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who's scoring the goals for Montreal? A lot of guys will score the goals. What are you talking about? <laughs> Plus, they, they're just improved across the board. They're just – they're way better. They're, way, they're better defensively. The price is going to be fresher. You've got Jonathan Duran with all the skill in the world. Hey, it's a conversation to be had when we have our season preview and we rank our teams. <clears throat> but for now, let's keep it to the fantasy uh, context. Josh Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Move um, on. They're going to so, win the division. Move all on. right. Um, so, Josh, do you have any final general advice, or are you ready for Kyle and I to move on to our sleepers, busts, and uh, breakouts? I guess the last piece of advice, and this is true for any years, there's so much depth at the center position. There's no reason to be taking a center in the, in the mid-rounds because you're going to find – the same quality, maybe, you know, 0.1% of a Z-score below in the 10th round versus you'd find in the 6th round. So I would wait. I would caution people on taking a center in the middle rounds when you can find value later on. 
Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. I, I think like the early parts and the mid parts of the draft will largely be dominated by wingers and defensemen. Just because I think your center argument holds up like every year, seemingly there's always this excess amount of depth at center. And then for goalies, as Kyle mentioned, it's an anomaly year where backups get all this value all of a sudden. So, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that point. Just for uh, to put some context behind this, I'm looking at our last year draft results and I'm seeing uh, Mika Zibanejad, eighth round. Um, oh, someone should have kept him. Yeah, who did Sean, keep him? Sean Couturier, 12th round. That was kept. He was kept. Yeah, that's a good keep. What about Kyle Connor, 15th round? <laughs> well, are we going to get into the our league now? Is that... No, 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 I'm just... <laughs> come on, I was hoping you'd give me some credit. <laughs> we'll get there. If you're we'll the center, there. I would. <laughs> okay. We'll get there. Um, so where do you want to start? Goalies? Uh, so did you want to do... St- Every position steals, or do you want to just do position and then we do steals plus breakout? Let, let's run through position. position. Uh, do the whole position first. Okay, so you want to start goalies? Yeah. Okay. And we're ranking them? No, you're just saying we're not even putting a cap on how many guys you could recommend under steals or busts. Okay. It's just whatever guys come to your mind. Josh, you can rank them if you want, top five if you want. <laughs> well, I already have my top two as keepers, so... Right. Oh, but we're t- we're talking steals, Josh. I like Kyle just when, when I hear the five. word steal, top five I steals. think I think guys who are going <clears throat> their ADP is much for sure. Okay. Well, if we want to jump into higher steals, than it should be, if we want to jump into steals, then um, yeah, I have a um, tandem that I would recommend. But we can. Uh, I'll let you guys start it off, and I'll join in. Sure. Nick, you want me to go first? Go ahead. Uh, so starting in the bust category. So just to be uh, just to be clear. So we're going to start with bust every time. Let's do bust. Okay. Yeah. So just to be clear with the audience, bust is not necessarily naming a bad goalie. It's a goalie that probably shouldn't be going his where his ADP suggests he is. Um, for me, my first and foremost is Connor Hellebuck. Uh, he's going super high. I didn't. I don't have the ADP here, but it's somewhere in the first two rounds. Sixteen. Sixteen. Way too high. Um, so he has the second highest goal saved above average, which means he was friggin' phenomenal last year. But he was getting shelled, and his team was not protecting him. Essentially, I, I don't bet on these kinds of things holding up. Um, and I and you know just looking at the Winnipeg defense and the the murderers row that is the Canadian division in terms of offense. I don't like this. From a uh, from a fantasy fantasy perspective, uh, so I'm going to stay away from Connor Hellebuck. Uh, my second bust is the Shesterkin slash Georgiev combo in New York. Um, now the Rangers are in tough against a, a really tough metropolitan division, and uh, again I look at their defense, and it's not looking good. E- like even if this is like a, a get both kind of thing kind of scenario, I wouldn't recommend getting either of these guys. Um, New York's going to be a fun team to watch, put up some goals, but at the end of the day, uh, I think they're going to get shelled by a lot of teams in this division as well. Uh, my next bust category would be Demko Holtby. Again, Canadian division team, Demko is unproven, so I'm not going to jump on that guy. Uh, and then the Holtby scenario, I, I just don't think Holtby's a great goalie. And I kind of looked at what happened to Vancouver last year in the playoffs, and, and they don't protect their goalies particularly well either. Um, so if you're one of those guys who's thinking, oh, I'm going to be, a, I'm going to be very bold and, and look at Demko's playoffs and I'm going to jump on this guy's going to be the next big thing, I'd hold your horses on that idea just a little bit. I think this is probably not the year, maybe next year, but uh, I'd, I'd be cautious of, around the Vancouver goalies. All right. Um, my three busts. I'll basically start from where I went a few minutes ago and say Caller Hellebuck is going too high. As I said, in that North Division, playing against the Leafs and the Oilers and Montreal. And sure, Montreal. It's just lots of goals. And behind a weak defense, 
I don't know if it's sustainable, his, uh, his numbers from last year. So, hey, not saying he's a bad goalie. He's a Vesna Trophy winner, but it's too high at 16. In fact, like a guy like Freddie Anderson at 52, I might prefer Freddie Anderson over Connor Hellebuck because Freddie Anderson's going to get more wins. I think the Leafs will dominate mm. that division and get more dubs. And if I can get Freddie Anderson 40 picks later, four or five rounds later, I'll take it. Um, my other bust, Marc-Andre Fleury at 82. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying this is going to be a bad pick for the first six weeks of your fantasy schedule or the first 10 weeks, but I think it's indefinite. As a big Vegas fan, a guy who's really plugged in with what's going on there, Mark Fl- Mark andre Fleury will be traded at some point this season, meaning he will not be playing behind the best team in the NHL come your playoff schedule. So he might be an asset weeks one to eight, but weeks 12 to 16, he might be playing for some you know, baggage team or a team that just doesn't have the defense that Vegas has. And so I think you're really rolling the dice and taking a risk by drafting a backup goalie on Vegas who's seemingly going to get traded in the eighth round. I think that's just ridiculous. And my final bust, and Josh is not going to like this. And again, I hate using the word bust because it doesn't mean they're bad or they're going to have a bad year. It just means they're going well too high, and that's Duka Rask. 33. The reality is, Yaro Halak's a great goalie. I owned him last year. He was my third goalie. He played every third game or so and was great. And his numbers were marginally behind Rask's, if not better. And I just think in this condensed season where Boston will arguably going, you know, 50 50, 40 60 with their goalie starts, it would be a mistake to draft this guy in your third round. It, 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 that's just crazy, especially if you can get Yaro Halak. I have it written here, ADP 124. So 100 picks later, I can get a goalie who's arguably as good statistically and will almost get as many starts as Rask. It, it just doesn't make sense to me picking Rask in the third when you can get Halak in the 13th. So those are my three. Um, I'll hop in now with my three. And to be honest, I'm just going to lump all three. I'm going to lump them all together because it's not actually three. It's seven. And I'm going with the entire North Division, the Canadian Division. I'm not Ooh, touching a fucker. single goalie there. Wow. This is going to be a goal factory every <laughs> game. I'm talking 1980s style, 6-5 <laughs> every night. We're going to see someone light the lamp every five minutes. It's going to be great. And that's why I'm fading every goalie in the North Division. Wow. Will that ever be good for the fans, Josh? It's all about the fan experience. (laughs) So, uh, sleepers? Uh, Let's make draft picks. I'll start with with the sleepers. Okay. Going by ADP, I think it's – impossible to ignore both Islander goalies. They're both being, if I, let me pull up the numbers here, but they're not even on the first page of goalies on Yahoo rankings. Mm. We're talking Sorokin and I think Varlamov, yeah. Varlamov. How could you not have those guys knowing how Trotz plays and the fact that they're going to at most let in three goals a night that's that's the type of consistency that you want at the back of your draft. And if you get one, good. But if you get two, even better. I'm I'm targeting both of those late in drafts. And I'll I'll just intersect for one second. Varlamov 157 ADP, Sorokin 171. Go on. Nice. There you go. That's my point. You want, you want me to go? No, no, no. Josh can keep going. Oh yeah, okay. No, those are those are my sleepers. Um, oh, that's it. Okay. All right. Um, what I guess go? I'll go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my steals. Another combo. 
Elvis Maris Linkus and Corpus Allo, 112 and 127, respectively. Mm-hmm. Again, it's going to be a timeshare. I don't see either guy going ahead of the other because Corpus Allo is the starter. He's always been. But Merzlinkus arguably has the better numbers and the better pedigree. <clears throat> so I don't think one guy's going to really beat out the other. But it's still good value getting the goalies behind a arguably top five defense in Columbus in like the 12th round. Um, so I really like that tandem. Nice. Oh, and one more. I do, I do like uh, this one a little lower, but Anton Kudobin at 88 is pretty good too because he's playing behind, again, arguably a top five defense, and it's the one year Dallas doesn't really have a timeshare. Ben Bishop's out for the whole year, and I don't think that backup, that young backup in, in Dallas, I don't even know his name, will push Kudobin for starts. Mm. So I like Kudobin <clears throat> – you know, in the ninth round, that that's not bad value at all. Well, uh, going last here, you guys stole a couple of my picks here. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say the Hamburglar in Minnesota has just signed a contract and buckle up because he's going to be the number one goalie in fantasy hockey this year. But other than that, I agree with what you guys said. Plus, I'll add a name in here. And this is not necessarily that his ADP is off. It's just to say don't avoid this guy. Uh, Darcy Kemper, uh, he had among the highest quality start percentage. 75% of his starts were good starts. And that is the highest in the, in the NHL. Um, I know Arizona is in a tough league when they face the big dogs. But when they don't, you can expect a good defensive system. You can expect Kemper to be a really great goalie give you good splits. Uh, Don't look for too many wins, but uh, a good, reliable guy as your second goalie, I'll take him. I'll take him. Um, Other than that, I've got what you guys have here. So with with Kemper, he's ranked in a range with a a few other goalies. We have Price, Freddie Anderson, uh, Tristan Jari, all in this 50 to 60 range. Are you taking Kemper ahead of those guys? Or... Is he just in the mix? Like whoever falls to you, you're happy to take one of those guys? Um, I will take Price uh, like first in that list. I'll take Kemper uh, ahead of Jari and Anderson is a a toss-up for me. I I think Kemper's going to get the better splits, but not the better wins. Okay. So he's right in that list for me, yeah. All righty. And then given we've done steals and busts so far Mm -hmm. and you've each opened each of those segments – I'll open the final segment, our breakouts. I got two. Uh, This one comes from a name I mentioned earlier, Ilya Sorokin. Nobody knows who he is now, but I'm sure by the end of the year, they will know who he is. It looks like Trotz is going to go 50-50 with the tandem in the island. And this kid has apparently been like the best goalie in the KHL like the last five years. And what a fit behind such a stingy defense. So I'll take, you know, 26 27 starts of this kid behind that defense no no problem and then my other one is uh tristan jari he finally gets the leash off no more bullshit tandem with matt murray the better goalie will finally get his starts and i think this is going to help pittsburgh immensely uh this kid's a stud and he's going to get regular starting time And, I mean, his ADP is pretty high, 77. But I still think it's decent value there. Like, this guy is a top 10 goalie, in my mind. At least in my model, he is. And if I can get that at 77, I'll take it. So that's it. I'll chime in here, and I got one guy. Samsonov in Washington. No more Henrik Lundqvist to challenge that net. Uh, Sam Sonov is the guy, it seems, and um, he's going to be playing behind a great team, a team that's destined for the playoffs. Uh, the wins will be there. I'm sure the splits will be just fine. And uh, I think if all rolls his way, he could be kind of pushing his name to the forefront of goalies. And my breakout candidate, someone who we mentioned earlier uh, mm. when talking about uh, reasons to pick players, 
And this is uh, Francis on Colorado. I see him as a nice breakout candidate playing on a Colorado team that's just going to cakewalk through this division. I don't see him getting tested too much in the 30 or so games that he plays, but uh, I, I really look, I'm looking forward to seeing him uh, take a, on a, a larger role as well. <clears throat> Moving on. You good? Yes. Okay. Where do you want to go now? Defense. Defense. Okay. Start from bust. Yes. All right. You want to go first? Sure. Uh, my bust. Big bust here. Alex Petrangelo. <laughs> I think many will draft him because his name has been up in lights over the off season, but he'll be adjusting to a new environment and is not guaranteed as much power play time uh, or even for that matter, the lion's share of power play time. Uh, it's likely, but you can't guarantee it. So don't draft him too early. I mean, Shea Theodore did a really great job on that power play before. So I just, I would just exercise caution with Petrangelo. Um, Victor Hedman. Don't take Hedman in the first two rounds. Are you out of your mind? He's had some injury troubles to deal with recently, and we've already gone over what injuries can do to you this year. Uh, he doesn't have that, you know, peripheral dominance that you'd see out of some other defensemen like a Roman Yossi. And they don't have a Nikita Kucherov, which undoubtedly will hurt his point totals. So, Hedman, I'm not touching in the second round. You're out of your mind. Uh, Quinn Hughes. Another reason uh, is about those peripherals. I mean, he's got, yeah, he's going to get points. That's great. He's going to get power play points. That's fine. But he's pretty much below replacement level for peripherals, something like a 120 shot pace. I know that would kind of send Josh to the grave, a player like this, and, and like 20 I hits. Yeah. So, well, I don't know. This guy, I mean, I'd, I'd prefer. Like a, a defenseman who can get 50 points, 200 shots, and 80 hits, rather than a, a Quinn Hughes who can get 65 points, 120 shots, and like no hits. So um, don't take Hughes too early. I'm glad uh, you mentioned that, Carl, because one of my defensive busts is one of your favorite players, and it's for that exact reason, Kale McCarr. <laughs> That's different, Josh. He'll get way more shots. Are you shitting me? In my model, he's projected to get – 112 shots with only 38 hits, making him someone that I'm going to avoid when looking That's at over 56 games, though. That is over 56 games. So it's not too bad. And lucky for you, Josh, you can already avoid him because he's been kept. Yes, so he uh, you can pat yourself on the shoulder there. <clears throat> yeah, the he's going to get 70 stands. points. So <laughs> 70 points? Yeah. I wish you the best of luck. <laughs> um is that it for you Kyle? that's it Alrighty. uh three busts Fuck. eric carlson 84 mm. <laughs> uh, i think it's going to be a dark year for san jose oh. sucks for the san jose fan <laughs> to say that but i think they're destined for the basement Ooh. and uh i think carlson's plus minus is going to take a hit <laughs> He's going to be behind Burns in the depth chart as far as power play. I was looking at their depth chart the other day. Burns is manning the point on both power play units. What? I love that. It's such a flex. What are you talking about? I, lo- I love it when you go on daily face-off and, and the same name pops up on the first power play unit and the second power play unit. It's such a flex. I've only seen that with Ovechkin and Burns, and I love it. Uh, Carlson is on the point on the second unit with wow. Burns, but he is not on the first unit. Um, and he struggled in San Jose last year. Like it, it was not a great start. Like he didn't really get into rhythm until, you know, midway through the year. And then of course he had the injuries. So he's, he's predisposed to injuries. If that can always come up, he's not great on the depth chart and he's not the shot monster burns is. I don't mind burns value like at 55 or wherever he's going, mm. but Carlson at 84 is a reach. My other one around the 80s is uh, a young guy in Winnipeg called Pionk. How the hell has this guy gone to an 83 ADP? Mm. He, I know they're saying he's going to be the power play quarterback, but that seems far-fetched because the only reason he got that role was because Josh Morrissey got injured last year. 
Josh Morrissey's ADP is 170. So 100 picks later, Josh Morrissey's getting picked, and I think it's arguably Morrissey's job. Like, I just don't – unless I miss something, I don't really see how Pionk's been anointed as that quarterback. Like, he might be that today, but I don't think that's going to last 56 games. And 83, that's so high for, for a defenseman like this. So I, I don't know about that. And then the other one, 112, is Charlie McAvoy. McAvoy. I don't – the player's great. He's arguably the best defensive defenseman in the league. No. But – from an offense perspective, he's never manned the power play. <clears throat> it's really not his job to start the year. I believe Matt Grizzlick's going to have that job. Ooh. And it's a fantastic job to have, manning the point on arguably the best power play in the league. So that'll be an interesting thing to key in, keen in on, is it Grizzlick or McAvoy who gets the power play spot. But Gr- Grizzlick's going way, way farther than McAvoy. So if you're reaching for McAvoy in the 10th round McAvoy. or the 9th round, you're a fool. Oh, because he hasn't earned anything. He hasn't been appointed as the quarterback. He, he had two power play points last year. So please don't reach on Charlie McAvoy. If he falls to you later and you want to take the chance, sure. Scoop him and Grizzlick and you'll be guaranteed to get those power play points. Mm. But don't make it a, you know, incentive to get him with your 10th pick. That That's just malarkey. Mm. So there you go. What are we on? What are we on? Josh is going to mention his busts for ah, defense. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I mentioned Makar, um, who I, I do believe will be a bust, despite um, maybe in my model specifically he'll be a bust. Uh, he will put up points, but for my model, I don't look at points from a defenseman very much. Um, and Nick, you stole my other two uh, busts. I was nice. so Pionk and McAvoy, especially based on ADP. It just it the the market is not caught up to the reality that these guys are not going to produce to the same level that we're expecting them to. Sorry, no, Josh, they're you're not. They're not established assets. Until you're an established asset, until you've been a quarterback for a full year, you don't warrant that kind of pick. But what about uh, you're talking about Josh? You also had McAvoy. Yeah. What if these two players do get that spot and then all of a sudden their value goes the other direction and they become yeah, hugely sleepers. valuable? Yeah. So you're running a risk because Pionk did perform very, very well last year on the power play. But like, wouldn't, wouldn't you rather take the surefire thing? Like, wouldn't you rather pick Chris Letang at 70? Sure. Than Pionk at 83? That's what I'm looking yes. at is the, the value around these players. I'm, I'm not saying that they won't meet value or maybe even exceed, but I'm saying that the players around those ADPs I'd rather have. I'd rather have a Latang, a Morgan Riley, um, who's around Pionk, or with looking at Charlie McAvoy, you got Ryan Pollock or OEL, who are both players I'd rather have. I think it's a big risk and reward thing because – I can tell you without looking at my screen here that Pionk triples the hits and shoots more than Morgan Riley. But wouldn't you rather just not run the risk? Well, and, that's what you have to take... ask yourself. Yeah. No, no, no. no. You, can, you can have a situation where it's just reward. If you draft Josh Morrissey 170 and Matt Grizzlick 180, it's only reward. There's no risk. There the is... risk is I drop them and I pick a guy on the waiver wire. I didn't lose anything, right? I used my 16th and 17th round pick on them. So just the simple answer is avoid those guys like the plague and go with Morrissey and Grizzlick. It's easy. I'll I'll let you guys avoid those guys. But but I will say to Josh that uh, in Makar's rookie year, he's on pace for 72 points and 175 shots. And I I think he's likely to get to about 200 pace on the shots. So that is a crazy bust. You're you're out of your mind. You're out of control and in that division. You're playing with fire in that division. Makar is going to light the torch of the LA Kings, and you know it. 
I want you to go on record and give us splits. <laughs> What's his goals, assists? How many shots are you projecting? Because I, I project still, over 82 game projected. That's fine. I can do the math. But um, in my model, I don't consider, I don't weigh points and assists, or I don't weigh points as heavily as other people. I'm much more of a peripheral guy because I think that's where value is. And I see Makar as an average producer and at his ADP, I can find someone like a Dougie Hamilton who will get twice as many shots and twice as many hits. And I'm happy with that. Makar will get at least 70 points, at least 12 goals, at least 190 shots. Over 82? Yeah. Massive value, massive. Save the tape. <laughs> Store it into the archives. <laughs> yeah. We'll revisit this. So you, you've gone on the record twice now, Kyle. You're making a point stat line projection for Makar against Josh here. <clears throat> yeah. And you've also made a bet with Joe that Josh Anderson will have a better year than Max, than, Domi. Than Max Domi. Yeah. How are we measuring that success? Well, that, that one's just a matter of who uh, has more points. Like, oh, well then, Joe fervently be believes well, Domi's going to have a better year. Is it just points, though? I, I could argue that. I could argue I that. I think you guys, if, if I you look at the losing, tape two then... months ago, I think it was just points. If yeah, well, Pierre-Luc Dubois gets his wish and is traded, I don't see how Domi doesn't end up with more points than Josh Anderson. Yeah. Going back to my point about who's scoring for Montreal, I don't <laughs> think it's going to be Josh Anderson very much. How many goals did he have last year again? Uh, that's when he was injured, Josh. When he was injured. And you know that. I just wanted you to say how many goals he got. I will not. All right. Um, I don't know. To... That's why. I, don't, I just don't know the answer. <laughs> okay. Can we move to steals? We may. I want you to start, though. Defenseman steals. Tyson Berry at 102. I like what? this value a lot. He's not in the top 100, and he no, will yeah. arguably have 30 power play points. Sorry, I wasn't listening. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Tyson Berry, I love his value. Even if the plus minus takes a hit, I want that exposure to McDavid. McDavid. Um, the tandem of Ekblad and Yandel. Ooh. Ekblad's going 130. Yandel's going 125. As early as this morning, I heard that Aaron Ekblad is manning the top unit. Really? It's unprecedented in Florida. Wow. It's always been Yandel's job. So look out for that. And that's why Yandel's value is taking a hit and why Ekblad's is going <clears throat> up recently. So they're hmm. both going around 125. Your 12th to 13th pick. I don't think you can go wrong getting either of those guys because we all know how much success Yandel's had like 25 power play points a year playing with Huberto and Barkov on that deadly first unit. And then the final one, and this one's way down, P.K. Subban, 167. Wow. I know he had a tough breakup. Oh, you know, with come Lindsay on. Vaughan, things aren't looking so good. You know, off the ice, things are not good. But I think on the ice, he, you know, with that distraction out of the way, he might have a resurgence. He's manning the top unit. With Keisher, Hughes, Palmieri, you know, it's not the best power play unit, but at 167, I'd have him as my fourth defenseman. I'd roll the dice and see what he can do. I think he's beyond his best years, but the value and the lack of risk at 167, I'll take that. So those are my three. Okay. Well, I'm happy to jump in and explain my previous Kale McCarr hate, and it's because I am a believer in Ryan Graves. I think he can have – what was that reaction for? Sorry, go on. Like, why is Ryan Graves being mentioned on this show? Like, <laughs> like what – Because in the fantasy What value context, does this guy have? In a fantasy context, he brings – not only does he bring a repl- – an average replacement level amount of points. He's projected to get 23 in my model. He also has over 100 shots and 100 hits, which in a bang-up league like we're in, goes a long way. So despite his ADP of 203, I think 
he'll far outproduce that. I see him as a top 100 player in this year's draft, and I'm willing to take him well before the 20th round. If we ever have, I don't think we even have a 20th round. <clears throat> no, we don't. I mean, I guess you're not wrong. Like, I, I just looked at him on Yahoo. He's 64% owned. So clearly there's this demand for Ryan wow, Graves. That shocks me. And, and I know, like he, led, like, he was near the top last year as far as plus minus. So according to Josh's rationale, he's covering shots, hits, and plus minus, three of the six. What are you saying, Kyle? Uh, I don't see it. I don't, I don't see a fit. I, I don't see the shots. I, I maybe see the hits. I see zero power play time. Uh, and especially with Devon Taves coming in, he's going to get buried, this guy. You're talking, oh, this guy's getting buried. This guy's getting buried. I like him. He's a good guy, but he's not on the top pairing. He might be on the second pairing, but I, I'm not inspired whatsoever. He had 134 shots in 69 games last year. That is not a good pace. For a defenseman. That's... For a depth defenseman, it's not bad. I don't know. Over 82, like a, that's that's close to 155, which is well above average for a defenseman. I guess it's about average. Like where? Like I'm just pulling up their depth chart because when I think Colorado defenseman, I think Makar, Gerard, and as soon as this year, Byram. And then of course I think of, you know. Eric Johnson, he's been there for years. Mm. Ian Cole, Devon Taves, you mentioned. Like, w- with the addition of Taves, I can't discount Kyle's point, which is Graves might be a 5 6 defenseman. Do you want to own a 5 6 defenseman who's only playing 15 to 17 minutes a night as one of your four defensemen? I, I am. And I think it, it comes back to the fact that Colorado's playing in such a weak division that everyone's going to eat on that team. I think having a five or six defenseman, I don't think he's even going to play that, that low on the team. Um, they have him listed right now as, uh, as a four with playing with Gerard. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I, I, I see him as a sleeper going off his ADP of 200. I would be more than happy to take him in you know, even the twelfth round, which doesn't seem like much of a um, <clears throat> much of a reach for someone like that, who's going to produce shots and hits, both of which are categories that I value from defensemen more. Than Honestly, that. man, I don't like hate the pick, but you might just be able to get him on the waiver wire. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't think anyone's going to reach for him in our in our league. Well, this wasn't about reaching; it was about a sleeper player that I. Would, yeah, um, and I think like Graves fits that mold to a T. Um, someone who's to, up to this point has been, you know, not talked about at all. You guys were yeah. surprised I even brought his name up, and I think that just speaks to the fact of how much of a sleeper he is, and how if you are someone that is willing to take a risk on a player um, late in a draft, this could be someone that you might want to spend that pick on. Sure. All right. <clears throat> Uh, is that it for your uh, sleepers, or can Kyle? What do you guys say? I have some sleepers. Okay. Go ahead, Kyle. Uh, my first sleeper will be Jeff Petrie. I'm not sure uh, what his ADP is because uh, I forgot. I think it's to, high. I forgot to look that up, but Jeff yes. Petrie over the, over the last three years has averaged 45 points over 82 games, 177 shots, and 186 hits. Uh, make no mistake, Shea Weber is still on the power play, but but Jeff Petrie is the more talented offensive defenseman uh, at this point. I think it's it's turned over now. Uh, this guy is just super solid, gets minutes, uh, decently. It, it, I can see here he gets more than fifty percent of power play time, um, and he just he covers the peripherals that Josh likes, and he puts up points. Uh, so wherever he's going, I think it's good value there. Um, my second sleeper, Tommy Shabbat, ADP of 110. This is a guy who could conceivably in this 
division put up 60 points. Now, to, to go 110 as a 60-point defenseman is, is crazy to me. Uh, he's going to be on the top power play with, with an, an addition of Dadanov and perhaps a Tim Stutzel, which could invigorate things, net front presence, and Brady Kachuk. I love this pick at 110+. plus. Uh, this guy is going to put up big-time points here. Uh, and then contrary to your guys' pick here, I have Charlie McAvoy at 110 ADP. Uh, if this guy does happen to uh, get onto the top power play, which, I mean, is very conceivable, like him between him and Grizz- Grizzlechick, I, uh, I don't know if I can lean towards Grizzlechick because Charlie McAvoy gets around 41-point pace uh, off the power play. This guy's got offensive potential. Uh, if I was Boston, I'd want to keep my top defenseman happy and put him on the top power play. Give him a cookie. Give him a cookie. And then uh, that 41-point uh, pace could turn into 50-plus, and he gets the hits, and he doesn't get a lot of shots. But that's why I'm having my uh, McAvoy as a sleeper here. I read an article the other day. It was basically talking about Boston's offensive efficiency on the power play when they rotated between Grizzlick and McAvoy when Krug wasn't on the ice. And Boston's power play was significantly more efficient with Grizzlick manning the point. He just has a higher offensive IQ. And if they lean into those numbers, the analytics, I think they'll speak for themselves and it'll be Grizzlick's <clears throat> job. So that's why I still maintain 112 is too high. One last word on that is McAvoy's contract is up in after 2022. And I'm telling you, you, this guy's so valuable to the team, you don't want to bug him. You don't want to put him on line yeah, two. Yeah, and you also don't want his point total to skyrocket or else you'll have to pay him, you know, another $3 million AAV. Well, then you risk – well, you run the risk both ways. It, it's a double-edged sword. It's like Zach Hyman. The reason the Leafs aren't putting him on the top line is because they want <clears> his <throat> salary to be down because he's a pending UFA and they don't know if they can keep him. So bury him on the third line with Mikheyev and Kerfoot, put Joe Thorne on the first line, and hope for the best. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't think it rolls that way. But again, it's a it's a gamble. Like if he doesn't end up there, then he's still a good pick where he is. That's the thing. Like the guy gets forty points a year. That that's pretty darn good. Uh, and if if he does end up on the top power play, then we're talking way way more valuable. All right. We got to finish up with our defenseman here, so I'll go with the breakouts. I just got two. I'll be quick. Shea Theodore, 92. Uh, this guy's yet to put together a full caliber star season. I think it's this year. If the playoffs were any indication where he was arguably statistically the best defenseman fantasy wise in the playoffs, I think it sticks here in the regular season. I think Pete DeBoer now knows this is the guy. If you're going to man a power play, it looks that way in practice so far. He's ahead of Petrangelo in that respect. And if you can get him in the 10th round, you do it. So uh, Shea Theodore, 92, he's going to have a breakout year. Everyone will know his name following this year. And uh, this one, less certain about it, but I thought I'd jot it down anyways. Tony D'Angelo, 104. Uh, Again, 10, 11th round. If you can get the quarterback – of the Rangers power play starring Panarin, Zibanejad, or uh, Lafreniere. Whoa! I think, I think you take him. <clears throat> so 104 for D'Angelo. Not bad. Not bad. Not bad. I have one breakout that I'm going to bring up, and it's uh, Rasmus Dalin. I Ooh, think. Good pick. I think with Taylor Hall, the addition of Taylor Hall that power play just got extremely, extremely lethal. And with Darlene at the point, quarterbacking the power play, all I can see is him racking up the apples right now. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, good good pick. The only thing that worries me with him is how high he goes. I uh, Where do you have him ranked right now? I have him at around 120. Um, let me write him down here in my spreadsheet. I have him as my 69th best fantasy asset. Oh, wow. And my 
15th defenseman off the board. So there you go. That explains why he's a, he's a breakout for me and a, a well, a well ranked player for you. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, I may have gone off the reservation for breakout candidate in a traditional sense, but uh, it probably should have been a sleeper instead, but I'll say it. Uh, did it? Uh, I don't know if someone already said Tyson Berry, but uh, Edmonton had the top. I had, him, I had him as a steal at 102. Okay. Yeah, so same reason as Nick. Edmonton had the top power play last year. Uh, this is why they got Barry is to man that power play. Uh, if it clicks, his power play points could be among the best amongst the defensemen. Uh, so breakout candidate there. I could see it working out for sure. So keep an eye on that. Alrighty. Uh, um, as, a right on, shot, as a right shot defenseman playing with a bunch of lefty shooters, um, I, I, I do see Edmonton being a top power play again, but I don't know if he's going to be able to maintain that, that role. We saw it last year with the lease where, you know, he was given every opportunity to be that, that quarterback on the power play and, you know, with this very similar setup and he wasn't able to do it. Well, um, I don't know if he's able to do it this year. I, I think just as long as he can stay there, Josh, as long as he can do just well enough, he's going to get peripheral points just from McDavid and Dreisaitl doing their thing and him just being a, like even a bumper guy there, just passing putts. Yeah, I think if we had a, a third assist, he'd probably lead the league, but uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't see him controlling the puck very much on that on that power play all righty uh forwards you left wing start? left wing left wing okay steals are, are busts yeah i only have one bust oh wow yeah. okay good uh philip forsberg <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you um you're an ass i read an article the other day you don't like me and i read an article why. okay um <laughs> This John Hines character, who mutual friend of ours, Andrew Bell, alluded to as an mm. alien-looking figure the other day. <laughs> um, this guy does not like to give forwards a lot of minutes. Like, if there's a star on his team, he doesn't like giving him 21, 20, 19 minutes. Not one player last year when he took over averaged more than 17 minutes a game. Mm. It's weird. Stupid. And if this is the head coach all year, I don't know if I have that much faith in Forsberg. I love the player. I just think utilization with the new coach might be dicey. Mm. And so he's, his ADP 71, very high in my opinion. 73 is a high range. Um, in my model, he's 100th. So he's going 30 picks ahead of where he should be going. And with this new coach, I, I'm just not a believer. So, yeah, the, the shot projections look good. The goals look good. The power play time looks good. <clears throat> but I don't want to run the risk with this coach. <clears throat> so I, I, I'm willing to just wait, let someone else draft him, and see if they prove me wrong. Fair enough. I'll, uh, I'll, I got four busts, so I'm going to run through them relatively quickly. Uh, Tuevo Teravainen at a 40 ADP. Um, I, I like the point potential but to me it's like it's it's too much of just points not enough uh peripherals there to be drafted at 40 um and that's going to be a, a common theme for me here uh patch already at 46 adp Ooh. i just don't see it for this guy i, I, I just I, I don't like this guy whatsoever i think he's kind of i mean if he had a good year last year which he did I think it was more of a fluke than, than him being good. I, I've never liked the player. I see a huge regression. Um, and I just don't like him at 46. Uh, and then I have Johnny Gaudreau at 48 ADP. Um, I don't see Calgary doing a whole lot of good this year, I'll be honest. Especially that, that top forward core, I don't have any, any faith in. Um, and him at 48 is just blasphemous to me. Uh, no peripherals. Uh, he's a loser of a player and don't draft him. Well, um, we could talk about the Pat Jardy, uh <clears throat> comment later, but I am a staunch 
disagreement with that. Well, please uh, get into it right now. Um, Explain. <laughs> the guy finished seventh overall last year, put up almost as, as many shots as Ovechkin. He's just a shooting machine. He's on pay, or he's projected this year to get almost 110 shots or 210 shots, which um, is far ex, far above average for any position. I, I don't see how how he regresses past that. He's a he's a he's a shooter. That's what he does. He shoots, and if that's what you're drafting him as, then you're going to be happy with him. The points may regress, but the shots are there. He's a average hit he, he gets average hits and uh you know he's playing on vegas so his plus minus is going to be positive so again those three categories are checked off for me um if we're going back to the bus this one i can't believe no one brought it up patrick line the guy doesn't want to be there and you're going to draft yeah. him with your second or third round pick um, right not in our league because someone kept him but uh, we can get to that later, but <laughs> oh man, I don't, I don't want to own any piece of Patrick Line. Who knows where he's going to end the season? Yeah, that's tough. That that is a tough one because things are really bad right now. Just a lot of uh, unknowns. But if he is to live up to his potential, it's it's a good keep. It's a good pick. But it's just it's so unlikely at this point. The guy now wants the, to play Fortnite. He doesn't want to be in the NHL. The, the uncertainty alone would be enough to scare scare me away for sure. So, but like I, I would I would still pick him, just not in the two three range. No way. Yeah, that's where his ADP is right now. He's he's uh, on on Yahoo. He's either twenty twenty one or twenty two, depending on your your scoring format. And I think that's just way too high. Yeah, it's funny. I had I had two names you guys mentioned. Line A and uh, Tara Vine and right in there. I scratched them out because, like, I just – I don't know enough about that situation, like, minute-wise and as much as the Forsberg thing. But just my intuition looking at the ADP was, holy shit, Tara Vine's a top 50 <laughs> player and Line A is going that early? Like, I, I was a little shook. Mm. Yeah, it, it definitely does not line up with the realities that we are seeing right now, uh, especially mm-hmm. after that, that awful press conference that he had where, you know, he oh. was all asked some pretty uncomfortable questions. And, you know, he, he, fared, he fared pretty well, but I, I think it just shows that his days are numbered in Winnipeg and uh, who knows where he ends up. I, you know what I don't like, Josh, was, was that comment he made, uh, well, I'm here, Gretzky. aren't I? Oh, I thought you were going to say, well, Gretzky got traded too, comparing himself to Gretzky. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. This guy's, this guy's a prick, man. He's such a prick. I think it's safe to say that the Leafs made the right choice. Oh, yeah. Um, all right, do you have any uh, more busts, Josh, or can we move on? Let's move on. All righty. Uh, Steals. Negatively. Left wing. I'd like to start if that's all right. Good. Uh, this is an obvious one. Sleepers. Jamie Ben, 144 ADP? Holy shit. I don't have that. I what do you have? I got him at 118. I don't know what you're looking I have at. 144. Check again. Check your source. But I'm this. On Yahoo. What do you got? 117. Okay, maybe it's gone yeah. up then. There's no way he's going 144. <laughs> okay, so anything like – You got to update your uh, – You got to update your, your model thing. there. You update your model. <laughs> Still, this guy, I don't know. Th- this is too low for this guy. I know he had a bad year last year, but uh, just a very solid overall all guy. He's not going to have uh, Sagan, <laughs> but still, for him to be going – well. 144 is bad, but 100 is, is sort of bad, but I see him more of in like the 80, 90 range. But I don't know. That's, that's not so much of a hard hitter now that it's, I know he's not 144. But moving on to my next one, Anthony Manthony, who you know I love big time, 155 ADP. He's going way down there. Uh, this guy's just a machine in terms of points. Like him and Larkin run the show in Detroit. They have the keys to the kingdom. I know they're a bad team. 
but they put up points. They put up power play points. This guy shoots, hits, does it all. I'm going to take him 100% with my fourth overall pick. Um, Kubalik at 123 ADP. Hey, listen, someone's got to score in Chicago. He had a, a, a hefty goal total last year. He's going to get all the opportunities, and he's going to be in Patrick Kane's back pocket the entire year. Um, so at 123, I'm happy to, to pick him a little bit higher than that. I got one, and I'll, I'll keep it short and sweet. Oliver Bjorkstrand, Oliver Bjorkstrand, Oliver Bjorkstrand. The guy is going to produce this year. We saw it at the end of last year what he could do in the playoffs and in the bubble. I think he continues that. And uh, at his current ADP of around 150, uh, I'm all over that. So this is why I love that show. Like, I'm making an audible in my draft strategy right now. Like, Mantha totally slid under my nose. Oh, you fuck. And now I'm getting him. I shouldn't have mentioned anything. You see, this I is really the thing with the show. You're giving away your hand. Then I'm going to start giving away less. <laughs> You're a prick. That was awesome. I totally forgot about it. <laughs> um, all right. Three names. Fuck Jimmy this. Ben. I like that one too. ADP is 118. No. I got him 65th. So I'll take Wow. Him. That's too high. Nope. Nope. Uh, Andre Palat. 160 ADP. I got him 91st. Uh, I wouldn't he's touch playing that with Stamkos and frozen in stick. point. Full time, I want it. <laughs> Especially if he gets a spot on the power play, which you might get, given the absence of Kucherov. He sucks. And finally, Jonathan Marchesol, oh! ninety-nine ADP, arguably out of the top one hundred. And Where I'd say he's that? got a chance of being a top fifty player. Uh, yeah, who has him so ranked fifty-five? So long as he doesn't 55. get traded. Sorry, what's that? Yeah, who has him ranked fifty-five right now? Yeah. Like I, I think he's a, he's a steal if you can get him there, and I mean the only caveat is, and again me being very plugged in with what's going on there, he might get traded. There were some murmurings that it might happen, so that would derail his value. Going to Josh's point about being in a weak division where you can just muck the Kings in Anaheim and Arizona and San Jose, but if he stays there. All season, it's great value if you can get him like 70 or 80, given he might finish in the top 50. So do not sleep on uh, Marcheseau. Bingo. I love Marcheseau. I don't think he's a sleeper, though. I think he's, if anything, he's been, he's been the guy that I've been following the, the closest because two weeks ago he was ranked out of the top 100, and now he's at 55. So... He's been one of the well, fastest he might, he might be ranked there, but his ADP, like the objective reality of where he's going, is 99. So that, make, that to me makes him a sleeper. Yeah, and uh, like I was saying, um, two weeks ago he was ranked outside the top 100, and today he's ranked 55. So I think – What do you mean? Like, like your model or Yahoo? On, on Yahoo. He's really? Cur- he's currently ranked 55. So why is this ADP 99? ADP takes into account all, all drafts. So two weeks ago when people were drafting him at 99 or uh, lower than that, it aggregates the mm-hmm. ADP to 99. So, you know, two weeks ago people were taking him 130 and, you know, he's slowly risen up, but obviously not to that level where the ADP has caught up. What's, the, what's like the cause of the rise? Like what's happened in the last two weeks to warrant that jump? I think people just forgot about him. You know, there's so much firepower on Vegas and he can slip through the cracks. Yeah. Okay. You know, he's not um, behind Pacioretty uh, on left wing. And <clears throat> so, you know, taking a second line center in the top 50 or a t- second line winner and winger in the top 50 is, uh, something that people shy away from. Yeah. Alrighty. Uh, who who do you guys have? Steals. Uh, I did mine. Or you just went. So yeah. Josh, <clears throat> please add to Marta. So. Well, I had Bjorkstrand earlier as well, but um, mm. I'll do one more. I, I didn't want to 
uh, release my cards because we haven't drafted it yet. So um, I gave you one, but I'll give you another one that I like. And uh, this one fits into my model more than it does anyone else's, but it's Lawson Kraus. Ooh, Law- uh, Nick loves Lawson Kraus. Well, he, he might be even more of a breakout because on my radar, he still hasn't had a coming out party. Well, I just think that where he's currently ranked at 205, um, which would be undrafted, is way yeah. too low. So to have him as a sleeper pick, uh, just someone that you're keeping an eye on at the end of drafts, I think uh, would be a fruitful decision. Mm-hmm. All righty. Uh, finally, breakout. breakout. Breakouts. Can I start? This is sure. obvious for me. Lafreniere, baby. Lafreniere. 90 points. Here we come. Let's go. 120 hits, 400 shots. <laughs> Next question. You know, I, I thought I thought we'd go the whole show without mentioning him. Really, Nick? Just so, like, no one can talk about where, where they gonna... think he's going. Right, right. Where they'd reach for him. Like, I think that's best we keep it that way. I don't, I don't think we should talk about that. I agree. So I don't even know why you mentioned his name. Because he's a breakout candidate. He's a clear breakout candidate. Okay. I just can't wait <laughs> to see upset. you. He's a really I upset. can't wait to see you sad when I take him first overall. Well, if you take my guy, I'm going to take your guy. Guaranteed. Who's my guy? I will find him. <laughs> I, will <laughs> find the, I will find your guy. All right. You gonna pull some Inception shit and go in my <laughs> dreams and find this shit out? You might, you might be just posturing right now to get me to take him earlier. That's what you might be doing to get take, make you take laugh early. Yeah, that would suck because then that means I don't get him. I know, but you know you're not gonna get him anyway, so you might as well have me pick him really early. <laughs> <laughs> that would be pretty funny. Um, okay, <laughs> that's something Josh would do for sure. I've already started it. All these, everything <laughs> I've talked about is just planting seeds in your mind. <laughs> that's why I'm not talking about any players that I like. I'm just talking about players that you guys would like. Yeah. <laughs> um, same here, my friend. Same here. Well, in, in the same vein, this guy's kind of a, a cheat code because he's playing center, but he also has winger eligibility. And it's a, uh, Rupe Hintz, he's my he's my uh, breakout candidate stepping into the first line role with Sagan out. I think him and Ben are going to fa- find themselves, uh, you know, scoring quite a bit. And uh, at one seventy five current current value, I mean, it's a low risk investment, and I think uh, the reward is, you know, anything as high as sixth round. I think. Um, uh, yeah, I had him written down as my second option as well. But number one, Kirill Kaprizov, 148 ADP. He finally gets to play. Minnesota fans have been waiting years for this guy to move to North America. They finally get him. And if he's as highly touted as he seems, Black. he's going to have a great year. Um, they don't really have a star power play guy. I think this guy might be able to fill that void early in camp. It looks like they've got him and Fiala on the uh, top of the circles on their unit there. Did so, you guys hear about the, the Yahoo Fiala fiasco? No. What's this? Apparently the Yahoo writers forgot about Fiala and he was ranked in the 500s. So people, no. people who have already drafted either didn't scroll down far enough to figure out where he was or some – Lucky schmuck found him on the waiver wire after the draft and was like, "What the hell? This guy is easily a, a draftable player, let alone uh, you know a top half of the draft player." And and you know he was ranked in the five hundreds thanks to um, some human error. Wow! What a disaster! What a disaster! This is why you wait to the last moment of the draft. Oh, can I uh, can I say one notable name that I will not say it fits into our categories? But I'd like to mention. Keep an eye on Taylor Hall in Buffalo. If he uh, if he finds a connection with Eichel that that really clicks, like 
look out. Look out. Could be 100 points. Could be 100 points. I think, Next he's, a, I think he's a pretty uh, <clears throat> safe pick at where he's going right now. Um, I think. I say he's undervalued, Josh. Undervalued. Yeah, I could see that. I could see him definitely creeping up into, you know, top four round category, especially if that power play clicks going back to, uh, you know, me choosing Dalene as a breakout candidate. I think uh, that definitely fits in with what I'm projecting to happen this season. Mm, mm. Um, all right. Left winger – or sorry, right winger center. Right. Right. Okay. Steals or busts. Bust. I got one. Bust. Kyler Yamamoto. Bust. Fuck. Uh, 105 ADP is just too high. Too high. I like the kid. Seems like a good kid. I'd like to have him on my team. I think we'd be friends. <laughs> but uh, I, I I don't really like the guy. I that that's too high for me. He's had you know a half season as an asset in the NHL. I I don't think you know success for half a season warrants you now being arguably a top 100 player, <clears throat> especially when you're not even playing with McDavid to start the year. Like it sounds like he's with Drysidle, McDavid's with Nuge and Cassian. And he's not on the top power play unit. It's too high. Stay away. For context, he's going ahead of Jamie Ben, which is not nice. That's not right. So I, I've got two busts. <clears throat> First, Miko Rantanen, ADP 15. Um, great player. Going to put up points. A little bit poor on peripherals and relies too heavy on McKinnon. <laughs> Uh, if McKinnon goes down, this guy's going to, you know, fall out of that kind of value. Um, take him, for sure take him, but not in the second round. Uh, he's also injury prone, so another thing to watch out for. Uh, and then I have Mark Stone at 30. Great. I love Mark Stone. Great player. But 30, too high for me. Simply too high. And that's all. So I'll interject briefly. You fucked up again, Kyle. No, because it being a snake draft, I'm gonna pick. Like I have two picks in the top six. Uh huh. I was strongly considering Miko Rantanen as one of my two. Okay. I will not be drafting Miko Rantanen anymore. The, a... the, the listeners well, heard me flipping through my legal pad here. <laughs> don't listen. I to just me, put right? a big X through Rantanen's <laughs> name. So there oh you go. my! I can't do these shows anymore, man. I'm done. <laughs> we can't do draft shows. This is crap. <laughs> this is crap. Next question. All right, no, J- Josh is uh, busts on J- right wingers. Hey, eh? right wing busts. <clears throat> I'm going Mike Hoffman. I I, th- I think we've seen the best of him, and where he's being drafted right now, I just can't imagine uh, him paying dividends. R- yeah, who has him ranked at uh, 72? So mid seventh round. Um, I think in the seventh round, you can find way better value than him. Yes, he has the position eligibility, which is a plus uh, playing both wings. But I do think that, you know, players around him, like a uh, a Konechny or even a Tom Wilson will round out your team better than a, a player like Mike Hoffman. Agreed. Um. Before we move on to uh, steals, can I ask you guys about no <laughs> uh, Andre Svechnikov? Love him. No, no. He's he's Josh. Now, don't say anything. His six. He's a sixteen eighty p. Why has this guy like like I don't care what you guys like think of him. I more just want to know what no. about him has launched him into the tier of all those guys going in like the top 25. He's playing with Ajo and he also gets hits and shots. Right. I know the hits. I know the shots. And, and I can tell you saying, uh, that yeah. uh, one of the members in our league who has a high draft pick is considering him uh, as high as uh, first overall in our league. So. Oh, no. And I, I, I don't doubt that. Um, that's a mistake. I just had to ask because I'm like, 
I'm just stunned how much his value mm-hmm. has gone up since last year. Like, but it, it, it might have... be the biggest jump of any player. Well, it's because no. we have that, that, uh, the multiplier for Michigan goal, isn't it? Exactly. With wait, wait, the multiplier for what? Michigan goals. The lacrosse Michigan. goal. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, do you want me to, do you want me to lie or tell the truth? I don't know. I think, I think we've been pretty candid here. Josh was pretty no, candid. No, Josh here. is hiding his hand. I'm I, half no, I, my I, hand. I think, I think Shvestnikov has a legitimate chance to be a point per game, if not more player, couple that with a high shot total and high hits. He's perfectly designed for our league. And um, if I had the first pick, I'd strongly consider him given who's available. And I'm sure you're hoping whoever has the first pick is listening. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, Andre Svechnikov, you mentioned the peripherals. This guy's got 90 points written all over him. Book it. Take it to the bank. <laughs> High pedigree, absolutely living up to the hype, and then some. Like, what do, What more do you want? He, as long he's, as he doesn't fight a future star. anymore, we're good. Yeah, he's a, he's a future star. He's, he's better than a Mitch Marner. I'd take him over Marner any day of the week, every single day of the week. Already. In fact, moving on. I, yeah. I could see him topping out as like a Panarin level player. All right. I didn't, I needed to hear that because like, not that I'm, I might be interested. I might not be interested. Just me, the researcher looking at that. I was just stunned. I don't, I don't know if that's next year though. That might not be yeah. this coming year, Yeah. It, yeah we'll see. but in four years for sure, he's going to be a stud. Like a top 10 every year kind of player. So hence uh, why he's a keeper league kind of guy. For sure. Yeah. For sure. But I, I see again, him just he... running roughshod over the central division. Who's going to stop him? He's the biggest guy in that division. Um, Injury prone though, right? Fair enough. Uh, yeah. Too early to say. I never, I too never early. like to project injuries for players unless it's something that, you know, you can legitimately count on like a, a Gino Malik and missing at least a few games. Or a... He he just he plays such a physical game. It's almost like he's being vulnerable, whereas Ajo is just nifty. He's like Spider-Man. He's mm. not going to get into any bullshit, and you can count on him being healthy. They said that about Ovechkin, though, and he's never injured. Well, he's uh, – the, the guy's a Hall of Famer. The Russian machine never brings – I wouldn't compare Svechnikov to him right away. Wow, come on. Physicality was? Yeah. Okay. If uh, he had won the fight, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'll be really quick here. Three steals. David Perron? No. Uh, ADP 127. He's currently manning the top unit in St. Louis. Uh, the St. Louis power play at the moment is O'Reilly in the bumper. Bad. Um, That's piss. Braden Shen in front of the net. Such a Hoffman. Master. On his circle, Krug got the point, and Perron at the other circle. So he has taken over Tarasenko's spot on the top power play unit. So from the draft, like just day one perspective, I think he's a steal. But when Tarasenko comes back, he probably loses that spot. So we'll see there. Monitor that. Um, Alex Radulov, 130 ADP. It's, 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 that's too high. Or, sorry, it's – he's going too low. Or, I don't know, whatever the way you want to read into lower high. Yeah, I don't I know. It's, the point is, someone's going to have to score in Dallas. He's one of those guys they lean on like Ben. He's going to have to put in the puck in the net if they're going to be a playoff team, which a lot of pundits are saying they're going to be. So, you know, if, I think you can do better getting him in the 11th or 10th round if his ADP is 130. And the final one, I think uh, young Willie Nylander is being underrated a little. His ADP is 84. I think that's uh, a little high. It should be 120. No. In this this Sheldon Keefe model where they stress puck possession and skill and speed, I just think guys like him and, you know, 
Matthews and Marner and the kids. The kids. They they get this value, especially in that North Division, which we've talked about, which is going to be full of goals. So, I don't know, man. 84, to me, seems suspect. I have two, so and it, it. it can be – they can pretty much be the same player because – um, if you get both of them, you're only going to keep one. It's dependent on who wins the job. And it's Brian Rust and uh, Jason Zucker playing on Crosby's or Malkin's wing. Um, and whoever whoever ends up as the second line winger is going to be worth keeping. And whoever ends up as the third line, you're going to drop. Uh, Brian Rust is coming in at 160. And Jason Zucker is all the way down at 200. So uh, both guys you can target near the end of the draft. And depending on who wins out on the job, uh, you're going to see the returns. So keep an eye out. Yeah, Josh, I had Brian Rust as well. Um, And then I also had Kevin Fiala in there, who we talked about earlier. Uh, ADP around 80 to 90-ish. Uh, but he finished the year super, super strong. Uh, I see this guy as a 70 to 80 point player, and he's going to have the help of Kaprizov and maybe even a Rossi on that top power play. Uh, and I just don't like this guy's just got the skill to be amongst uh, the Shifleys of the world. So I, I could see you taking him earlier than 85 per se. All right. And finally, breakouts, one name. We talked about Rube Hintz earlier. I'll go Dennis Gurianov. Oh, that's bad. Um, And the guy I'll credit on this one is Joseph Camilleri. No, we will not hear that name. He made one pickup last year. The whole league, the whole year, one pickup. How'd that go for him? It was Dennis Gurianov. (laughs) He's fucking dead last. So if if, if this is the guy he chose to pick, and I know his credibility is a good guy. I'm going to put some uh, stock into that. He's also manning the top power play right now with Sagan out. He's also on the top unit with Ben. At 170, you can't go wrong. So there you go. My breakout is Capo Caco. Second overall pick entering his second year. Uh, he had a pretty bad year last year. He's had a long off season to ponder his mistakes. And he's starting the year on Panarin's, uh, Panarin's line. So I see big things out of Capo Caco as a breakout candidate. I'm not going to draft him, though. I'd wait for the waiver wire for that. I also had Capo Caco as my breakout candidate. So I'm trying to scramble and find someone else right now. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I really think that his confidence was shot last year and having his time to – sit and develop and, you know, just work on the mental aspect will do him some good. Agreed. Centers, shall we move on to the final one? We shall. And Josh, if you want to chime in with anything else, by all means, but we'll, we'll move on to centers. Let's do centers. Um, start out with sleepers or bust? Bust. Bust, bust, bust. Ah. You. Uh, my first bust will be Connor McDavid. This guy's a huge Nancy. Uh, he's not going to do as well as people think. And I'm just kidding. Moving on. I've got Evgeny Malkin for reasons we talked about earlier. Um, I really like Malkin. Good point totals last year, average-wise. He still did get injured. Um, again, the injury-prone nature will just hurt this season. I, I, just, I wouldn't touch him at a 28 ADP. Uh, let someone else take him. Uh, Braden Point at an average draft position of 14 is a little high for me, especially the fact that Kucherov is gone. If if those two were together, I could see them, yes, making some magic. I I would be fine with that. Um, But right now, I just don't see the value there. And then I have, yeah, those, those those are my two, Malkin and Point. And Josh, uh, Nick has just gone to the, the lavatory. So if you want to jump in with your bus. Sure, I'll offer up one. And it's uh, Patrice Bergeron. Whoa! I think uh, given the fact that Pasta is going to be out for at least a month, you can't be drafting Bergeron in, your, in the third round. Uh, you, ha- like you, you can't just 
given this, the fact that the season's going to be shorter, you can't be wasting that first month with a player like Bergeron. You can get value all around in the third round, and taking a player like Bergeron is only going to put your team at a disadvantage, and you're going to have to make that up at the end of the season. Um, one more player that I'm looking at. This player is um, a little bit down the board here, but it's um, Pierre-Luc Dubois, and it's the same reason uh, that I mentioned um, that I didn't like uh, Line A. It's because he's going to get traded or he wants to get traded, and that uncertainty makes him a player that I'm going to avoid. I think that's fair. I... I... I would love to draft a guy like that, but again, with this situation, I don't know if I can. Kyle, let so me Nick, hear your thoughts on uh, Matt Barzell. Uh, Are you it, taking him? Well, that's again, like the same scenario. Of course scenario. he's taking him. No, he's I, one of his favorite players. I know. I, 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 I don't up. know if I can. I don't know if I can. He's hiding his intention. This could be a holdout scenario. Josh, I'm reading it on his face right now. He is lying to you. I like the player, but he just he's not that valuable where he's going and given the contract situation. Just a fact. So do you think he ends up on Robita Island given Louis no. propensity for just ending people? No, his his name is too large to end up on Robita Island. But given Lou, something big could come about from this. So it is something to watch. And and like lose one to hold his ground. So that, that could mean that they're sitting out a while, which is just, yeah, it's, it's bad. Could you envision something like a uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois swap? Would that make sense for the Islanders? I can see it making sense for the, the Blue Jackets, getting oh. such a skilled player in Barzell. You know why I'll say... Uh, I'll, like I'll, I'll give you a quote that Elliot so. Friedman said. Elliot Friedman said, and I don't know where his source was, but he said Pierre-Luc Dubois wants a bigger stage. Make that what you will, but I don't see that being the Islanders if he has any credibility to that statement, which I assume he does because it's Elliot. Does so, it get any bigger than New York City? Well, uh, the Islanders, come on. Come on, man. They're playing in Brooklyn. Yeah, but still, they don't have the fan base to back it up. But if he's looking, I think he wants the city more than he wants the fan base. Maybe. Let's Maybe. face it, Pierre Luc Dubois isn't going to be pulling. He's not going to be a household name for the average hockey fan anytime soon. He's not going to have that uh, that face value when you walk down the street. You might recognize him if you're one of us, but mm-hmm. he's not going to be getting swarmed the same way a Crosby or a Vetchkin or Patrick Kane would. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't be shocked if that happened. I just think it would be really lame and boring. That's all. But isn't that what Lou does? Lame, boring, like things that make way too much sense is what he does. Like they need the center. Dubois is a great defensive center, big body, pretty much fits exactly what Lou wants. And he yeah. signed. He signed for two years. Signed that bridge yeah. deal. Yeah, and then Columbus gets that much needed uh, injection of pure skill. But then I don't know. Like, like does, back down his... does Barzell like jive with with Tortorella and vice versa? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Does anyone vibe with Tortorella? <laughs> is that his whole thing? Is that he just makes everyone so uncomfortable? Yeah, they... I could see like a Bergeron or a Philip Deneau vibing with a Tortorella, but that's about it. I can't even see that. <laughs> uh, so what did I? Uh, you, you need to. What did I miss? Who were your busts? Minor Malkin and Point. Mine were um, Pierre Luc Dubois, and uh, who did I say before? Uh, Patrice Bergeron. Is that what Kyle owed about? Yeah, was it uh, Dubois? I was surprised about Bergeron. Yeah. Given oh, the really? ADP. Yeah. I know you love Dubois, so I was. I, I thought that was that for. Okay. Uh, busts. Must Elias be. Lindholm. Yeah. Of Calgary is going sixty-eight. Don't like that. 
He's kind of dusty. I hate. He's that. kind of a dusty name. He's terrible. Why is he going sixty-eight? Like I, I don't, I don't, I it. don't know. I would never. I think have he's like going to have a solid year. Again, <laughs> given, <laughs> given given the North Division, I think that he's going to score points, and that's what you're going to draft him for. All right, I'll, I'll let you use your seventh pick on him. Go ahead. I won't. <laughs> um. I'd rather have a stud. How about that? Well, who's going in, in the same range as him that you have? Uh, Give me three centers that you would take or that are in the same range, and let's see. Let's play a game. Mark Shifley. I'm taking Shifley. Yeah. Uh, I don't have the list in front of me. I'll be honest. Hey. Uh, I'm just – I'm pulling it up right now. Give us some names, Nick. Like Drew, I'm taking Elias Finland home over Drew. Uh, that's Braden Chen, taking him over Braden Chen. Jamie Ben, taking him over Jamie Ben. Kuznetsov. This is where he's ranked on Yahoo. He's ranked 59th really? on Yahoo. Shifley's 61. I take Shifley over him. Braden Chen, 63. Jamie Ben, 64. Kuznetsov, 66. Like. What's later than that, though? Like, give me some names further down the list. Ryan Strom, 79. Dylan Larkin, no. 82. Monahan, 83. Oh, that's lame. Yeah, those I don't are know, lame. like, center, like, Nugent Hopkins is going 73. I'd rather have Nugent Hopkins than Lindholm. As would I. Um, yeah, I wasn't really Ryan, drafting him Ryan O'Reilly yeah. is going 62. Man. I think that's more warranted than Lindholm at 68. You're a fanboy. Those would be my two comparables. This is more of a gut thing for me, Josh, is I just I hate Lindholm, and I think Nick's probably the same way with the name brand. That's fair. I think uh, Calgary probably regrets the trade they made, given how much Hamilton's blown up. But, yep. um, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and uh, – Let's hope that both of them succeed this year. I guess you're not hoping that because you don't like Lindholm, but um, I hope he fails. Yeah. (laughs) Speaking of I hope he fails, bust. Jack Hughes. Yes! Nick, that's not a – people already know he's a bust. (laughs) You don't need to mention that. Um, His ADP is 155, so he really doesn't fit the bill of a bust. That's right around right. Just kicking a guy. He's inherently a bust. Just his career is a bust. Yeah. He is a bust. It's over. He fits the word perfectly. He does. Good. I just had to mention him. Thank you that's all that. I'm going to say. No, thank you for that. <laughs> Sleepers? Yeah. I'll start here. So I'll start strong, in fact. Jonathan Drouin. <laughs> ADP 174. This guy is not going to be drafted in our league unless I draft him. Uh, you heard it here first. Duran is about to have a breakout season. He's on the top line. He's no longer injured, has tons of talent, and doesn't have the immense pressure of the Montreal crowd getting in on him on every mistake he makes. That'll be huge. Buckle up for a Jonathan Duran season where he's already on a line with Nick Suzuki and Josh Anderson. Get ready. I heard he's not manning the power play. I, I heard he's they're setting him like... On, b- b- like below the line, like around the net. If he's on the top power play, that's all I ask. I know, but doesn't he want to be the quarterback? No, they've tried that. They've okay. tried that. It's failed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So who's um, quarterbacking Suzuki? Yeah. Suzuki is on a circle. Um, Weber's on the other circle. And Petrie's at the point. They're going three forwards, 2D. Hmm. I like that. I don't want to be blocking any shots on that power on that penalty. No, no, no. no. Uh, Dylan Larkin, I have here, uh, supremely talented. Pencil him in for seventy plus points. Uh, like like Mantha, he's got the keys to the kingdom. Every opportunity gets shots, points. Uh, your plus minus is out the window, but who fucking cares? Uh, Marcia So, like someone said earlier, I have him here as a center. He's he's both. He's dual eligible. Solid overall player. Needs more love. I'll I'll toss one out. I'll, I'll give you Bo Horvat. 
Right now, he's ranked 124 on Yahoo. I have him ranked around uh, 75. I think he's one of those guys that just quietly produces. Last year, um, he was one of those guys that you regretted passing over because he put up 53 points, 178 shots. Yeah, the plus minus isn't great, but who cares about plus minus, really? Hmm. Yeah, I I have Horvat too. His ADP is 146, which I think is crazy given he's on the top power play. A very good power play, I might add. And he might not be with Pedersen or Miller or Besser. You know, that second line's not as deep. But what's causing, you know, what's stopping Travis Green from changing things? So he's already going to be on the top power play. He's already going to cover hits. And he might end up with better line mates. I will happily take that value at 146. And um, as much as we hate on Calgary and we've been chirping him, Sean Monaghan's going 142. Mm. So that's... Uh, that's bad. That's very deep into the draft. I will and say you're talking one about- thing about the center position, and I think it's something that... Um, we spoke about earlier and it's people have realized that there's depth at the position and they're willing to wait. So I think Mm -hmm. these ADPs are a little skewed where you had people who took centers early. There's a big gap in the middle rounds where people are waiting to wait. And then near the end, you have people who didn't take the centers now scooping up these values, which could have affected the ADPs. Sure. The point is Monaghan might, you know, just based on ranking, it could be imaginable to see him rank between 90 and 100, like a borderline top 100 fantasy guy. Yeah, I agree. I and think so if you have him if, as your you, first or yeah. second center, you're happy with that. Yeah. Because it probably means can, that you have you can, some unreal wingers and defensemen on your team. Yeah. And if you can wait that far into the draft to get him, good on you. Mm-hmm. Um. And that's it for me. Breakout. I'll give you mine real quick. Trevor Zegras. Anaheim Ducks. Where is he going? Not going. He's not being drafted. He's not even being considered. Okay. And I think he could be in the conversation. For He's the- one of the few guys who can make the team out of camp. He will make the team. He will make the team. Uh, Stutzel will make the team. And Cousins will make the team. Yeah. That's like as far as I'm willing to go off the top of my head. Like, I don't think – you mentioned Rossi earlier. I don't think Rossi's making the Minnesota Wild. Come on. I don't think so. Really? My sources tell me – That will be a huge – He's going to Switzerland. He's going to Switzerland. That's huge. Wow. Wow. Unlikely. That's what I'm saying right mm. now. Okay. Okay, that's mine. Josh? I have, I have a player that probably is better off as a breakout last year, but I think he's going to build on his campaign this year, and it's uh, Mika Zibanejad. I think with the centers ahead of him, if you wait till mid-second round to take this guy, you will not be unhappy. I understand. I like him too. Uh, maybe breakout isn't the right word for him, but I had to show him some love because he's a guy that I've had my eye on and I'm disappointed that I probably won't be able to draft him this year. But he's going to be someone I target in trades for sure. Mm. Right. All right. Nick's just made some notes. Um, one name, Nick Suzuki. Mm. That's a good breakout name. It is. He started to break out subtly in the playoffs last year. I think you see the whole package here through a regular season. Um, he'll be the power play on the uh, the quarterback on the power play. He'll be leading a strong line of Duran and Anderson. Right. It can always be susceptible to change, but the kid's just talented. I like him more than Kulkin Yemi. I think he bring he's got a higher hockey sense, and he he just gets it. So. Uh, he will be a breakout in his ADP, 164. I have another breakout. Quinton Byfield. 
<laughs> Moving on. Moving. Yeah, let's just move on. That's it. That's all our positions. Not worth our time. He is not worth the time of this program. <laughs> he has not graduated to that level. <laughs> he is not a prime time player. This is prime time hockey chat. Yeah. He has not earned prime time minutes yet. Right. Right. He belongs on the amateur show. Understood. All right. The clock is nearing 11. So I want to open the floor to Josh. You started the episode by saying you wanted to devote like a little segment to just our league. So like, what are you talking about here? Like, what, what do you want to dig into? Well, What's this up with is you? the first year that we have done keepers and I want to break down our, our league's keepers and see, you know, if you guys are seeing the same trends that I did. And if you have any, you know, questions as to why people kept certain players over others. Mm. Um, I have, yeah, I have the, them in front of me and there's one person that stands out to me as a very perplexing keeper and it's David Pasternak in the first round. I just don't get it, especially given the fact that uh, this, this team had the opportunity to keep a player like uh, Patch already in the 15th round. It seems like um, maybe he missed the mark on what keepers mean. Nick? That's, that's Matt, who finished Moopsie. first in our league. Moopsie. He finished first. Did he really? Yeah. Huh. I mean, no one really did finish first because it did not formally conclude, but he was the highest in the standings, and it's why he's picking 10th this year. And his team was unreal, and he had so many options to keep. Brady Kachuk in the 11th, Andre Sveshnikov in the 14th, JT Miller in the 17th. And so to keep Pasternak in the first, it just seems like an odd choice. I think it's because it, he, he guarantees himself whenever Pasternak comes back, the best left winger in hockey and the best right winger in, in hockey, fantasy-wise. He will have both of those assets, but who knows when? I'm not sure. That's the only thing that's kind of throwing the wrench in. But, hey, if, if Pasternak was healthy, I, I, would, I would totally be on board. Oh, I agree. If he was healthy, but it's the fact that he's not and the value that was left behind. We're talking about Sveshnikov going first overall in our league. Granted, that's actually a third round pick because we have two keepers, but uh, you're mm -hmm. still investing a first round pick into him. Yeah, like right. I will. Yeah, like you're absolutely right, Josh. Like looking at his options here, he could have went. Patch ready 16th or Svechnikov 14th. Ooh. Svech at 14th that's, would be my pick there. That's crazy. That would be And my he's pick. willing to toss away his first and second picks. Okay, keep keep dry sidle because he's now a top five talent. He has cemented himself as a superstar. And he's healthy. And he's healthy. But with that Pasternak especially how he's dipping now, like how his ADP is now in the 30s with the injury, I would have kept Svechnikov and then hope I just organically get Pasternak with one of my picks, right? Mm -hmm. If you Even want Pasternak, you reached on him, yeah. he could have got it. Like if Matt's picking 10 and 11 under that yeah. scenario, or I guess, he, yeah, he'd pick 10 and 11. He'd probably get Pasternak with 10 or 11. Uh, here's, well, let me throw, let me th play devil's advocate here. If you had, uh, a, a Nathan McKinnon or a Connor McDavid who was injured in the same way, would you keep him? Probably not. Hell yeah. Well, this guy's got similar value to those players. I'm sorry. 1.36 points per game. Won the rocket Richard, huge amount of shots, young winger. He's very close in value to those players. Maybe, oh, well, yeah, yeah, he's very close in value. I wouldn't point keep those is, players only because I think that you would have the opportunity to draft them again. Given the, like, yeah, exactly. obviously, seeing now that we can see who's been kept, I was surprised at how many first-round picks were kept, honestly. Um, just because I. of how much value there was later in the draft. And seconds. I was disappointed. How about mm -hmm. that? No, you should be excited. You got more guys to choose from now. Uh, There's only two picks ahead of you. You have the third overall pick 
in a slew of guys yeah. to choose from. Yeah, I guess. But they're not as good guys. You know? Do we want to talk about the, the – Sidney Crosby the is the trade? best player on earth. You can get Crosby. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we'll see. Am I a fan from 2012 speaking or? <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll see. Do we want to? I can see the smile on his face right now. He wants Crosby so. <laughs> oh boy. Go on, Josh. I think you had a thought pondering. Should we introduce the trade to, to the listeners and see what they think? Or see. Uh... Yes. Yeah, they can write into the show. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, here's the gist of it. There was an opportunity to there's an opportunity based on the rules to uh, move around in the draft board, so to speak. And you know, some people agreed with it, and some people didn't. Um, at the end of the day, the the trade was a first round pick swap and a second round pick swap moving two spots up and two spots down um, in both directions. Um, There was some opposition to the trade, mainly because of some uh, misconceptions around how keeper works and what a keeper is. And I think we should address those those here on the podcast. (laughs) In my understanding, a keeper pick is the right to draft a player at a given price. It's not a... uh, You don't lose the agency over your pick because the pick hasn't been made. You just have the right to choose that player at a given selection. And I think that that was um, something that maybe we could uh, uh, unravel a little bit here and uh, dive a little bit deeper into the real issues behind um, the trade that was eventually declined and had to be uh, uh, rejigged to meet league approval. Um, I don't know if I've done it justice in what the trade was because for the listeners who don't know, this is, uh, it might've torn the league apart. Um, There was some pretty staunch opposition to it. And uh I don't know. I'd, I'd like to hear what you guys, your your opinions on the trade and, and why um, why you thought it was unfair. Um, some might even say it was immoral. For the record, uh, for the ladies and gentlemen listening, not one person in our league sided with Josh on this argument. Everyone who cared to vote voted against him. <laughs> And uh, I think for the very sole reason that Josh was trying to use a, what I describe as the shistiest used car salesman uh, kind of tactic that he could think of. Anything to get ahead. And Josh just thinks outside of the box. And the problem with the deal is, I don't care if you're swapping whatever you want, but my point of view is that if, there's other teams outside of the trading parties that are being directly affected by someone's moves in the draft, in a draft perspective. I think that's wrong. Very, very wrong. All right. So my first point is I wouldn't say you divided the league or fractured the league because they were Kyle's point it was literally an uphill battle for you guys. There's only two of you supporting this, the two guys who want to make the trade. There was not one, you know, neutral third party arbiter like me or Matt or Christian voting for you guys. So I wouldn't say it divided the league. I would just say you You guys, the the, the two guys who wanted to make a point, who wanted to make a trade were fighting an uphill battle based on the consensus in the league that it shouldn't fly. And then as far as my justification, like my personal reason for why I didn't vote, and I thought I stated it pretty clearly and concisely, is that by trading, by using that Vasilevsky pick, the keeper pick, 
you've already locked into it at two as leverage to move up in round one just seems like a shyster move because you're not really giving up anything. Like if that was an actual pick you're going to use in round two, like that had yet to be determined, and that pick would go lower in that round, say from the third pick in round two to the eighth pick in round two, then I'd, then I'd make sense. Okay, great. You're moving up in round one and you're taking a hit in round two. But your fate has already been predetermined in round two. You have kept Andre Vasilevsky. So nothing's happening. You're, you're not losing anything in the second round. You're only gaining in the first round by moving up. So while Michael's gaining, sure, because for some reason he wants to move up in that second round and is okay moving down in the first round, what you're doing is kind of using leverage you don't have. And so that's why I personally disagreed with it. I look at it as a way that can make it an interesting uh, wrinkle to the off season. Um, you know, we didn't have very many trades last year and th- I, I think there was only one draft pick traded the whole year which is pretty rare for rare. Uh, a keeper that, yeah. league. And the way I was looking at it was um, just a new way to – like a new wrinkle for trading, and a, new, a new market to be set, a new precedent. Um, you know, the way it went down obviously ruffled a few feathers, but I think that's only because it was new. And uh, I approached everyone ahead of me in the draft with the same offer – Carl declined immediately, which is why he doesn't even know that there was an offer on the table. Um, but everyone ahead of me had the same offer, and they were all given the same opportunity to make the deal, kind of start a betting war, which would have, you know, um, ended up having me um, m- maybe put more into it, lose an asset, if you will. But because there was only two people negotiating, it was pretty easy. To, to to make that deal come to fruition. So I think it, more than anything, it's the league's um, unwillingness to make, make trades that ultimately killed the deal, not the, the shystiness, as you've put it. Because I, I do think that there is an opportunity for more deals like this. And if there is a market to have bidding wars and to have people um, use that tactic to work their way around the draft and secure players that they want instead of having to do it afterwards. I love trades. I love ingenuity. This league that's been going on since, you know, me, Kyle, Matt, and Christian have been in this league since grade 11. Um, There's always been trades. There's been plenty, especially the deadline. There's always draft pick related trades of guys who are out of the hunt, moving up in the draft, gaining picks for tangible pieces of talent. For some reason, last year was a weird anomaly. Personally, I didn't really feel like trading, so I didn't want to jeopardize my position in this year's draft, so I I kind of stayed away. But I was surprised to see not as many trades. Um, So if that's your concern, that they're not going to be a lot of trades moving forward, just knowing a lot of these guys, I would say, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say that's the case. If, if both parties are willing to work and everyone in this league has seemed, you know, willing to work in the past, I, I think that trend only continues of, of there being trades. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's because I'm new and I, I don't know the history of it. Yeah. It's but, your first year. Um, yeah. I think also the fact that it is a keeper league and I have experience with keeper. Um, maybe I introduce some things that, uh, that might have uh, you know brought up concerns but I think well I know in in my other keeper leagues that these are common uh, trades that go on and uh, it's kind of become a thing where you can look forward to the offseason because now you're not beholden to your draft spot you can continue to make moves and um, it kind of brings a start to the season earlier than the draft which is always fun because I think we were all looking forward to starting this season and, um, you know, even setting our keepers was exciting having to, to 
run the numbers and see who is a good value and who you actually want to keep. Um, so I was just trying to add an extra wrinkle. Um, we can obviously revisit it later on or if uh, the league has a change of heart, but um, I'm happy with the outcome. I still ended up being able to move. I still ended up being able to move up a, a few spots to get to a, a, pos- a draft position that I am comfortable with. And hopefully I'm able to get the guy that I'm targeting, uh, not such to cough, but um, <laughs> with that being said, I think, uh, yeah, I think this was a um, great experience for me. Thanks for having me on the podcast. It's getting close to my bedtime. So I'm going to have to log off now, but uh, thank you guys. Look forward to, to hearing the final product and hope to be on the podcast once again. Of course. No, it was a pleasure having you. Um, I like this. We, we didn't, we didn't do a fantasy episode last year. We did one year one. I don't, I don't think we did one last year. So this was a nice change of pace. We often get complaints. We don't talk fantasy enough. We talk the sport and the reality and the news, but not the fantasy aspect. So this was nice. Um, you added a lot of wisdom and it was good to hash out what we were, you know, frantically texting about yesterday. <laughs> and, 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 and speaking of that trade, I mean, not like you, you saw Kyle and I supported the amendment and no one else really chimed in. So I guess I'll just go and approve that. I'll, I'll make that known in the chat. Like, cause I, I still haven't tinkered with the draft order uh, to, to make, to adjust for that amendment. So I'll make a post in the group about that. And uh, if no one says anything, I'll go ahead and pull. Yeah. Make it happen. Let's have an episode after the draft so I can explain my strategy without giving away my hand before the draft, because I think um, it's it's unique. And I think that um, getting an explanation for it might make it seem a little less crazy than it actually is. Sure. Sure. Uh, Kyle, any final uh, comments here? Oh, I just want to thank Josh for coming on. I, this probably should have happened a long time ago because we I've always known Josh to be a, a really wise sport mind in general. Uh, definitely want to have you back on as the season goes along. I think it could be a lot of fun. We'll, we'll make more of a, an effort at fantasy too. Uh, and I'm just excited. I, I just, I'm really happy to turn the page from the uh, world juniors and look and it, especially this Canadian division, so much to watch. I'm du- I've been pushing Nick to push the draft up because I'm so excited to draft. I think we should have it tomorrow, but Hey, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just excited. I, I want to get this stuff going. Yeah. And speaking of the draft, like I'm literally on the Yahoo homepage, two days, 20 hours, 45 minutes and counting. Oh, you can smell it. I want it. Yeah. Enough, uh, enough research. I'm done. I'm done. Yeah, yeah, I am crap. too. Unless anything crazy happens in the next two days, like an injury or a signing, I'm likely not really tinkering much here. Yeah. Um, Can I be honest yeah. with you guys for a second? Yeah, go on. I forgot that our league was only 10 teams, and I had been doing 12-team mock drafts. Oh, Yikes. you're fucked. So <laughs> uh, today I realized that we were actually in a 10-team league, and all the guys that I could have had – in a 10 team mock draft are now going to fall into my lap. So oh. it, it might've, it might've actually been a blessing that I've been doing these 12 team mocks because now I understand um, where I can get real value. Right. We'll see about that. We will see. Alrighty. So with that said, we wrap the second episode of season three of the rink moose hockey podcast. We hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, it was a nice refresher, a fantasy packed episode, and we hope you take our advice, at least a, a slimmer of it, and um, use it in your drafts coming up. I know there's going to be lots of drafts with only five days left to go till the season starts. So uh, good luck to all of you and enjoy the start of the season. The next time you hear from us, the season will have started and there'll be a hell of a lot of news to unpack. So until then, it's been a pleasure to serve you. Rink Moose is signing off.